Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. And this right here is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is what we're watching this morning. Charlie Munger, longtime confidant and partner of Warren Buffett, has died. The 99-year-old served and helped Buffett transform Berkshire Hathaway into an investing empire over their near six-decade relationship. We're paying tribute to the life and legacy of the investing titan with a special hour of coverage at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Plus, a rally heard around the world. Global bonds are soaring at the fastest pace since 2008 financial crisis, thanks to speculation that central banks may finally be finished with rate hikes. Fed Chair Jay Powell is set to speak on Friday. Investors will be closely watching for further policy guidance. And General Motors is looking at you, investors. The Detroit automaker this morning out with a string of announcements, including a $10 billion stock buyback. It's aimed at boosting Wall Street confidence in the company after a tumultuous year of strikes and EV setbacks. Yahoo Finance executive editor Brian Sazig will discuss all this and more with the GM CEO, Mary Barra, just before 10 a.m. Eastern Time today. You don't want to miss that. We want to turn to our top story of the day, the life and legacy of Charlie Munger. The Berkshire Hathaway vice chairman and investing legend has died. Now he was 99 years old. Munger was Warren Buffett's right-hand man. In a statement, Buffett said, quote, Berkshire Hathaway could not have been built to its present status without Charlie's inspiration, wisdom, and participation. For more on Charlie Munger's legacy and his impact on the investing world, we want to bring in Bill Smead. He's Smead Capital Management Chief Investment Officer, as well as Lee Munson, Portfolio Wealth Advisors President and Chief Investment Officer. Lee and Bill, it's great to have both of you. And Bill, let me start with you. I, I know you're a longtime follower here of Munger, a longtime investor uh, within Berkshire Hathaway. In terms of the legacy that Munger leaves behind, how will you remember Charlie? Well, a couple of his favorite thoughts are, are, first of all, the key to success in investing is weak competition. He, uh, he w wanted to do things that other people didn't want to do, use long-term time frames that other people didn't want to do. And then his other thing that's very important is ignorance avoidance. And, and uh, uh, we, 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 we look at what most professional and amateur investors do uh, leads to a lot of stock market failure. And, and Munger was very uh, keyed in on avoiding those mistakes and avoiding ignorance, like chasing popular securities or uh, buying uh, uh, based on whims and, and uh, he would say fantasies. <laughs> you know, uh, Munger, didn't, he didn't suffer fools. Uh, E easily, right? He he would just tell him the truth, and it's uh, uh, it, it it was a it was a uh, a joy to enjoy his education. Th those two men have been incredibly generous with their education of people like myself. And Lee, I want to bring you into this as well. When you think about the hallmark strategy, the mindset that Munger leaves behind, and that the markets will forever remember, what comes to mind for you? you know, own good companies and just sit on your butt, right? The, Charlie Munger was really more of the punk rocker of Wall Street. When I was growing up, my dad always said, you know, Buffett's a showman, but Munger's the guy you gotta follow. That's a guy you really wanna be in some way, shape or form. What Munger is always, what I got from him was, number one, I'm a value player. And that's a problem because you always wanna find you know, good deals and great prices. But what Munger brought to the table with Berkshire Hathaway, specifically Warren Buffett, was to get him to buy really great companies at merely good prices. You know, I wonder, would would Buffett would have bought Coca-Cola or bought Apple Computer if it wasn't for Munger's influence? And so I think for all the value players out there and everybody who follows Buffett and is kind of a cult, which there's a lot of us out there, is just remember, Munger always wanted to get fabulous companies at a reasonable price and Buffett didn't. And he taught Buffett how to buy great companies versus being stuck in that 1930s mentality from Benjamin Graham of only look at the cheapest things on earth. And Munger said, yeah, but are they gonna keep working after we're dead? Are they gonna keep producing? Are they really a great company? Or are you just buying something because it's $15 in cash and they've got $10 in shares? The other thing I wanna say is, he taught me don't leverage and you only get one time to be rich. And the thing that I've done in my life ever since I heard about this years ago is write your obituary now. I've done it. I've actually done it a few times. And then you try to live your life 
to match it. So if there's anything we, we should be doing today late in the evening is write our own obituaries and live up to it. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Lee's saying. Uh, he, he, Buffett, from the time he went to work for Graham Newman, uh, he had a, an amazing information advantage for a number of decades. So investing in common stocks was just totally abnormal, especially in the aftermath of the 29 crash, the Great Depression, which Buffett jokes about because he says, I wouldn't be born if my dad hadn't come home early from being a stockbroker. <laughs> and and uh, so Warren and Ben Graham, they had an information advantage. They wanted to buy 50 cent dollars. And so what happened was by the 60s, between say the end of World War II and the mid 60s, that had all been flushed out. In fact, we had an era very similar in the mid 60s, they called it the go-go 60s. Uh, Kathy Wood was named Jerry Sy, and the Manhattan Fund was up 130% in a single year, and the go-go 60s based off the space race, et cetera. Mm -hmm. By the way, here rhymes. What are we doing now, space race? Uh, <laughs> uh, so so uh, that's the point at which you no longer had an information advantage. Everyone had the same S&P sheets. Everyone had value line. Everyone had the, 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 the access to the information. So then Munger said, you've got to make your money by better decisions. That, that's, that's what this is all tied to making better decisions off the information that everyone has. And then lastly, I'd like to add to that, that, that there, there was a, a, a superior intelligence, not artificial intelligence. There, were, there is a superior intelligence associated with the algorithm of decades of investment experience. The rhymes that have to be trusted Munger and Buffett trusted the rhymes. When the Berlin Wall fell, they, they could look and say, hey, there's countries all over the world that are now going to have access to capitalism in a way that they hadn't. So we'll buy Coca-Cola because somebody might want a clean and tasteful drink of water at a whole bunch of countries that Coke had never done business in before. And, and, and that's that's those algorithms kicking into gear, good decisions uh, rather than an information advantage. And Leah, as Bill speaks about the investment philosophy of Warren Buffett and of Charlie Munger, uh, since we've gotten this news uh, yesterday afternoon, there also has been a focus on succession and exactly what that is going to look like now that uh, Buffett obviously questions just about what exactly the future holds and what exactly the direction is for Berkshire going forward. I'm curious to get your perspective, just what you think Munger's ma passing means for Buffett personally, but also for Berkshire and the direction of the company moving forward. Well, you know, Munger said a few times that some of the uh, replacements uh, then the succession plans that some of those are better business managers than Buffett himself and kind of pokes fun uh, Buffett a few of the meetings. So, you know, we've had decades of having these guys be really old. We've had a few decades of people saying, when are they going to die, right? I mean, Munger's 99 years old, right? So this isn't a new topic. I mean, even, you know, 10, 12 years ago, Munger was saying, people have got to find a new cult hero here. You know, I'm timing out. So I'm not really concerned about Berkshire Hathaway. Now, when Buffett goes, which eventually we all will, that's going to be interesting to see if the stock actually reacts. But when you consider the type of people that they have and the decades of experience that they've been able to pass down, I'm not really concerned about Berkshire Hathaway longer term. In fact, I would always look for opportunities where people get emotional about these cult heroes passing away and thinking that Berkshire's best days are behind them. I would say that, you know, when these two guys, you know, one's gone, the other one's going to go eventually, then you have a whole new breed of people that took everything that they learned and there's more of them. So I really don't think it's going to be a concern of investors at this point. Yeah, well-trained, um, uh, just a depth of roster that they have, but no doubt the entire firm feeling this loss, at least here on the day right now, and his legacy going to continue to be remembered profoundly. Bill Smead, Smead Capital Management Chief Investment Officer, and Lee Munson, Portfolio Wealth Advisors President and Chief Investment Officer. Thanks so much for helping us pay tribute this morning to investing legend Charlie Munger. We've got a special hour of coverage that's at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, everyone. You do not want to miss that.
Well, this morning, we're also tracking General Motors. General Motors is trying to get back on Wall Street's good side with several investor-focused initiatives. The Detroit automaker is reinstating its 2023 guidance to include an estimated $1.1 billion in earnings before interest and tax. This comes after the outlook was pulled back because of the United Auto Workers Union strike. It also plans to increase its quarterly dividend next year by 33%. That is an increase of 12 cents per share. And they're expected to initiate an accelerated $10 billion share repurchase plan. Now, a few of the things, as we just put a little bit more color on some of these numbers here, um, they also said that GM is expected to deliver very strong profits in 2023. Thanks to an exceptional portfolio of vehicles that customers love, good operating discipline, that uh, statement from GM chair and CEO Mary Barra. But one of the huge things, even as we're taking a look at shares moving higher by about 10 percent, the entire industry has really had to wrap its mind around what the actual demand environment looks like right now for the number of electric vehicles that are being purchased versus what the ambition to produce and deliver is in this near term and multi-year uh, capacity that companies like GM, like Stellantis, like Ford have all put forth into the street and then some of them backed off of those most recently as well. Yeah, Brad, I think this announcement today is really GM just trying to show investors that they are confident that they're going to be able to keep steadily generating cash while they are allocating those investments like yeah. you were just talking about to the EV transition. Of course, lots of questions just about adoption rates and how quickly we are going to see that transition take place. What stood out to me, though, in this letter here from Mary Barr two shareholders, her reiterating once again that she is confident in GM's ability to continue generating that significant free cash flow as the company does make and pivot to its EV transition. They're trying to offset some of these higher costs. We're not exactly clear just in terms of the speci uh, how specific in terms of where those cuts are going to come from. It's going to be fixed and variable costs in terms of where they are planning to cut. They didn't go or didn't specify beyond that. But this is a stock that has been under tremendous amount of pressure when you compare it to the performance of the broader market off just about 14 and percent since the start of the year. You're looking at gains though today of it was up just over 8 percent right now up just, uh, up just over 10 percent here in the pre-market. So investors clearly very encouraged by this announcement from GM and exactly what this could potentially mean there just in terms of their confidence for the company going forward in this transition. Yeah, giving the street some numbers to chew on that essentially puts it at the lower end of the spending range that they had put out before. Yeah. Uh, now looking at full year 2023 capital spending to be 11 to 11 and a half billion dollars. The prior range was larger. That was about 11 to 12 billion dollars. So we'll continue to watch this going forward. All right, well, later on this morning, Yahoo Finance's very own Brian Sazi, he's going to be sitting down with General Motors CEO Mary Barra. She's going to weigh in on this announcement and more that all gets underway later on this hour. Well, Apple and Goldman Sachs are parting ways. That's according to several reports. Now, the tech giant sent the big bank a proposal to end its partnership on its credit card and savings accounts in the next 12 to 15 months. So what does this mean for car holders? And who better to ask than Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley. And Dan, we were having this discussion uh, earlier this morning. I think there's a lot of card holders out there that are asking, what exactly does this mean for me personally? Yeah, I mean, I have, uh, I have an Apple card myself. Uh, <laughs> it's not bad. So uh, what's going on, man? What's going on, Apple? I need to figure this out. But uh, <clears throat> chances are they're going to keep this going. Uh, you know, but let's put things in perspective real quick. The, the Apple Card, uh, the Apple Savings Account that they just recently launched with Goldman, it's not going to be a huge part of their services revenue, right? You're going to get most of their services revenue from something like Apple Care, like uh, uh, Music Plus, like uh, Apple TV Plus, Fitness Plus, things like that. This isn't necessarily going to be a huge part. What it is, is a lock-in, mm -hmm. right? If your credit card is attached to your smartphone, why the hell are you going to go pick up a Google phone? It's on your iPhone. So, you know, that's that's part of the idea there. Ditto if you have a savings account with Apple, then you're definitely not leaving. So it's it's all part of the lock-in. Now, there's there's been speculation in some of these reports that uh, they would go with uh, different banks. That's probably what's going to happen. Uh, Apple's been kind of, you know, putting its toes into the financial market for a little bit with this card in 2019, uh, with the savings account, uh, with the buy now, pay later plans uh, that they have. They don't run the actual banking part, though. That's where Goldman comes in. So it's an Apple brand. It's, a, it's, it's Goldman on the back end. When you get the card itself, sure, it says Goldman on the back. But when you pick it up, it looks like an Apple product. So, you know, I, I, I think they're going to continue with this. It's just going to be a matter of 
I guess, reissuing cards to people if it's going to be a new financial institution, uh, and then continuing to see if that institution will move forward with Apple indefinitely. I think, you know, if they pulled out, it would be kind of egg on their face entirely. Uh, I don't think they're going to do that. This is a chance for them, uh, as I said, to really push forward the lock-in for users. Look, you buy a pair of AirPods, you buy an Apple Watch, yeah, you're probably going to stick around, but it's not, you know, a do or die after a few years. If you want to go to an Android phone or something like that, you can. Again, if your banking is connected to your phone, you're not ditching that company. You're sticking with them for the long term. You're going to continue to buy their products and their services, and that's really what, what this is about. You think about sentiment around Apple as a technology company. Would that same sentiment prevail if they were seen as one of the major tech companies that was influencing financial services? That's a good question, right? I mean, you you look at Apple as this huge innovator in the tech space. Um, people have generally good feelings about Apple because mm -hmm. they love the phones, they love the iPads, they, they love the products. It's a sticky right? ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, when you get into the, the financial side of things, though, uh, people aren't really going to feel as uh, warm and fuzzy about Apple if they really started going headlong into this. Mm. Uh, so I think the idea that they're separate from the actual you know, banking infrastructure gives them kind of leeway, right? The, the card also, by the way, I mean, the way they set it up is awesome. The colors there basically indicate what you're spending on and how much you're spending. You can pay early. Um, there's issues with how they uh, uh, give statements, which is different than other credit cards. So that's something that Goldman was trying to deal with um, cause problems with customer service. And so, you know, now that they're, they're seemingly backing out according to these reports, you know, it would behoove Apple to ensure that they keep everything the same outside of the, the actual back-end banking stuff. I didn't know that the colors meant what you were spending. Yeah, on. yeah. yeah. That's so it's like purple. It's like, uh, uh, I think it's for Apple products. If it's for transportation, it's going to be a different color. It's great. They show you on the, on the phone. Uh, on a map where you actually spent something. So yeah. you're like, uh, like I have a Capital One card as well. This is not a plug. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I get that and I look at it, I'm like, I don't know where this business was. Yeah. You know, I spend stuff constantly. If I look at an Apple card, I can say, oh, right, I was there, I was there. Had a few drinks there. I think it's hazy. But I guess I went there. <laughs> we so, just need yeah. to know what the bad color is so that everybody yes, knows yeah. what to stay away from that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Dan, thanks so much. It's good to know what's in your wallet. Thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> Yahoo Finance's own Dan Halley. Uh, let's also talk what's on the feats out there. Foot Locker is bringing investors some holiday cheer this morning. The retailer raised its full year outlook after getting a boost from strong Thanksgiving sales. Now expecting comp sales to decline by about 8.5% to 9%. That's up from the previous estimate of a decline of 9% to 10%. Now, the street was pushing this higher last I checked this morning, um, but there you're taking a look at some of the actuals versus the estimates. Ultimately, um, was a beat on the top and bottom line here for the company. But the comp store sales, this was an area of weakness, decreased by about 8%, ongoing consumer softness, changing vendor mix, impacting from the repositioning of Champ Sports, they called out. They also called out some higher shrink as well. That impacted the gross margins uh, as well as occupancy, deleveraging. And so all of these things considered, there were some significant weak spots. It's just not as bad as it could have been in some of those areas, at least from what investors may be reading through this report on. Yeah, I think you're exactly right, right? It wasn't a stellar report by any means, but it was better than many had feared on the street, and that's why we're seeing the reaction in shares here this morning. The call just getting underway at the top of the hour, but some of the comments within this report, within this release from CEO Mary Dillon, calling this, once again, a reset year. She also went on just to talk about the fact that it's still a backdrop of ongoing customer uncertainty right now. Now, the company did announce new partnerships are going to be entering India next year. They're also expanding on their partnership with the NBA, with Foot Locker here serving as the marketing partner uh, going forward between the two, or Foot Locker and the league here. So exactly what that means, how big of a catalyst maybe this could be be for Phil Locker here down the line, obviously, is going to be one of the questions that we're going to ask uh, the analysts later on uh, next hour. But when it comes to that higher promotional activity, this is a trend that we have seen across the landscape when it comes to retailers doing everything they can to get their customers inside their doors. I mean, take a look at these inventory levels from Foot Locker. They're still relatively elevated. So you got to ask the question about what exactly that promotional activity is going to look like in the current quarter. Maybe that's why we're, they're seeing stronger than expected demand over the Thanksgiving holiday. But 
but then but then of course looking ahead to 2024 and how long they expect that promotional activity to continue. You know I'm in Foot Locker three to four times a you week. You are. And the basketball you should be our category. Expert. We don't even need an analyst. Well, I'm a, well you know what? We'll just report from uh, shoes on the ground at a, at a Foot Locker next time they do earnings, perhaps. So mm -hmm. do you think they're improving? Um, no, I think the inventory right now is extremely high in some of the best, especially when you think about basketball and the Jordan sales typically that they've seen in the past. It's been a stellar year for New Balance as well. These are items that they should be absolutely being able to move through. The fact that it's not selling out on Nike.com or on the sneakers app in some cases for some of those more coveted, what would typically be more coveted SKUs, that says a lot to me about the consumer environment, and then it also says a lot that you can continue to find them at multiple Foot Locker stores as well. So. Yeah, well, they're just so reliant, too, on Nike sales in yeah. general. All right, well, Jack Ma is reportedly calling for change at Alibaba. Now, in, in an internal memo confirmed by several reports, Ma urged the Chinese e-commerce giant to, quote, correct its course as up-and-coming rivals like PDD, Pindo Duo, and ByteDance threaten its dominance in the online retail space. Ma also called AI a big opportunity for e-commerce. He co-founded Alibaba back years ago and has largely stayed away from the company's day-to-day -day operations over the last three years. Now, we know Alibaba shares have been under some pressure this year with the stock off just about 13% since January 1st. But looking back to the high levels that we saw uh, during COVID, we are well off of those high levels. So, of course, the question for Alibaba is what exactly the direction looks like of this company going forward. We know Alibaba recently shelved the plans to spin off and list it's $11 billion cloud arm. We have new leadership at Alibaba. So exactly where they are or how they are steering the company, I think is a big uh, question mark here for investors, for analysts at this point. But I mentioned there the Pinduoduo Duo and also ByteDance. Obviously, more pressure here from some of the rivals out there, stronger competition, and then also just the weaker recovery that we're seeing take place in China, just among the challenges that are up against Alibaba and some of its competitors as well. Right now. Yeah, that doubling of revenue that Pinduo Duo was able to see, certainly catching some of the eyes over internally at Alibaba and, and none more so than Jack Ma here, specifically uh, the co-founder over at Alibaba. But now when you think about the new leadership team and, and how they're thinking about these individual units that still are set to spin off, uh, that's going to be a larger concern, I think, for investors to figure out, OK, what are the actual parts that will still be remaining together? at the end of the day, where are those margins going to be generated from and where does that trigger some reinvestment into the business more long term as well. Let's also talk a little U.S. Treasury bonds here on the morning. They're on track for the biggest drop in yields since August 2011. Where were you when? Well, that was when Standard & Poor's cut the credit rating of the United States. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is standing by at the Yahoo Finance Interactive with the answer. Hey, Jared. I remember that day way back, I think it was August 11th in 2011. Nevertheless, there was a huge drop in yields that much, and I think it's notable that we're finally uh, matching, if not eclipsing that, this month, we have had an almost nonstop rally in bonds for three years, at least in, in rates for three years, and now just getting a little bit of relief. Let me show you what's happened this year. This is a 10-year T-note yield, and this little move right here from 5% down to 4.3%, 70 basis points, and not even all of that was in the month of November. That was enough to generate this signal. But you take a look at what's happened in the last three years. That is a huge rally in the 10-year, basically off of zero to north of 4%. But I'm going to show you another chart. This is a max chart. This goes back uh, to the late 1980s. And you can see there is this huge and significant downtrending line here. And we have finally broken above recently within the last year or so. So it's kind of a sea change in bonds. And so not only is the close, the cyclical nature, do we have to deal with the business cycle here, but we also have to deal with, deal with secular trends as well. Um, I just want to show we had incredible movement in all of the tenors this year, the 2, 5, 7, 10, 20, doesn't matter. And Bespoke is saying this, given the violence of bond market moves we've seen in both directions this year, a continued decline uh, and ultimately flat yields for 2023 cannot be, reeled out, cannot be ruled out. Um, this is the bond market as it's being expressed this year. That is a lot of volatility. And uh, just checking in on, for instance, the volatility of the bond market, we can get that from the move index. That is still elevated. So we're not quite out of the woods just yet. Let me show you, um, here's, uh, that's a max chart. Here's a three-year chart. And you can see that we are still in the 
middle, basically, of this range, going all the way down here. And that's even more stark when you put it in the 10-year context. Um, now, you conversely, uh, you compare this with the VIX. The VIX is hanging out by uh, multi-year lows here. I don't know that we're out of the woods with respect to the bond market, but it has been nice for stocks to have this reprieve. Uh, stocks are pricing in a Fed that manages a soft landing, something that arguably has only been done once before in 1995. And if they thread the needle just perfectly, yes, uh, we're going to see some uh, more upside price action in stocks. And if they don't, well, there's going to be a massive repricing in, in risk when and if something breaks. But uh, don't want to deal with that. We'll have to wait for that one, guys. Hopefully, we're not going to have to think about that anytime soon. All right, Jared, thanks. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Mid expectations that the Fed could be nearing rate cuts next year. It was Governor Christopher Waller that instigated a broader risk on move yesterday. New Edge's Ben Emmons writing in a note this morning that his comments caused hedge fund titan Bill Lackman to make a quote about face. Now, Emmons saying that the billionaire investor now betting that the Fed will start cutting interest rates sooner than the markets are predicting. The CEO approaching Square Capital Management saying that he sees the Fed cutting rates as early as the first quarter of next year. Now, the debate continues, of course, in November. We spoke with J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon about Fed policy, and here's what he had to say. I think they're kind of right to pause here a little bit and see what happens. Uh, but I suspect that they may not be done. I think there's a chance that inflation is just a little stickier than people think. And the fiscal and monetary stimulus of the last you know, several years is, is more than people think. Unemployment's very low. Uh, we'll see. So, but I think the conversation here this morning is really surrounding the comments that we've gotten from Fed officials, especially yesterday, policymakers, I should say, when it comes from the comments from Waller. Also, what we heard from Michelle Bowman, too, that are very hawkish in terms of rates and what they have said, very vocal about maybe what is necessary to get inflation under control. When it comes to Bowman, she did stop short of saying that a rate hike would at least be necessary later on this month when it comes to what could happen 2024, of course, that's everyone's guess, and that's why we have estimates 
really across the board when it comes to rate cuts. Yeah, I, I love the charts that uh, our good New York Marathon, our friend Ben Emmons had put within this email and within some of the notes that he he compiled here, saying that we're basically at Fed peak hawkishness and dovishness, one of the charts uh, that was therein. So that was uh, particularly perplexing. But at the same time, when you hear about the Fed speak that continues to transpire at this point in time, it makes total sense here. And one of the things that he noted within this historically a, fee, a peak in the Fed funds rate has coincided coincided with a peak in hawkish tone in Fed speeches based on hawk dove scores from readings and speeches taking place from NLP models. The Fed reaches peak hawkishness in speeches and messages about six months before the first rate cut. So that's why that chart particularly caught my attention. If we're thinking about six months from now, whether or not there will be a rate cut, it would start to show up in some of that tone and tenor that we hear from the Fed right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Waller's comments, it was a bit surprising just in terms of how confident he sounded. And he said he was confident that he thinks policy right now is currently well positioned in order to get inflation back to that 2% and do so without seeing substantial weakness in the labor market as well, which of course has been a critical uh, question mark here for the markets in 2023. And then, of course, looking ahead to next year. All right, well, opening bell on Wall Street. Let's do a quick check of the markets. Jared Blickery standing by at the big board with some of the moves that we're seeing a little bit to the upside here this morning, Jared. Yeah, just a little bit. I think investors will take it. This is a two-day look at the Dow. It's up a whopping 60 points today. Here's the Nasdaq up about two-thirds of a percent. Looks like it is leading in the pack. And here's the S&P 500. Let's just show this uh, three-day price action. Gives us an idea of what's happened this week. That that is in the green for four tenths of a percent. Also, small caps, which came alive recently and then seemed to have uh, just kind of petered out, uh, they are actually down this week eight tenths of a percent. Already checked in on the bond market a few minutes ago, so let's skip straight to the sector action. Tech, by far and away, uh, the biggest contributor to gains, although real estate looks like actually closing in. It is now number one. Consumer discretionary and industrials, uh, also energy and materials, all of those outperforming on the top row. And I'll show you what the NASDAQ 100 looks like. Uh, almost a sea of green here. I want to look inside and specifically look at the software industry that has been soft, that has been stronger than the chip industry. And we see some outsize uh, performance here from Workday. That's an earnings story. That's up 9%. CrowdStrike up 5.4 percent. Uh, here is the chip section, and we can see a number of issues above 1 percent. AMD among those. NVIDIA up two-thirds of a percent. And just checking in on some of our leaders here, meme stocks and regional banks, those look like they're in favor, at least according to those two ETFs. Software, Bitcoin, uh, already talked about the regionals, cannab cannabis, and also home builders. Lots and lots of uh, broad groups of uh, things moving to the upside here today. All right, Jared, thanks so much for that. Well, bets on rate cuts are rising and the bond market is moving in tandem. Treasuries rallying and at the fastest clip since 2008. The momentum helped by some dovish Fed speak in recent days and progress on inflation, despite the core number remaining somewhat sticky. Our next guest has been overweight equities all year long, and he says it wasn't a popular call at all, but they remain there. Joining us now, we've got Ryan Dietrich, Carson Group's chief market strategist, here live in living color with us. Yes. Ryan, great to see you in person today. This is a great studio. I'm glad to be here, guys. Appreciate it. We put a lot of work into yes. it here. Look, you put a lot of work into these calls over the course of this year, some of them unpopular at the time that you made them. Why do you continue to, to stick by them? And at what point do you kind of reverse or change course? Yeah, Brad, you think about it. A month ago right now, we were in a correction. It felt like the end of the world. Yet, if we look at really the consumer, I mean, I know you guys have talked about it, the consumer, we're still making 200,000 jobs every month. Productivity is strong. We're looking at all time uh, record high earnings next year. Things aren't perfect. Delinquencies are creeping up. We're aware of some of the cracks that are out there, but just overall, it still makes sense to us when you look at the overall picture of a market that simply is seeing more participation, right? We all know seven stocks are going up. Kind of disagreed about that, but now we're seeing way more participation just in the last four weeks or so. So again, we get into some of the more things we see, but we've been overweight since December last year. People hated that when we did it. We're still there. We still think next year the bull market's here and there's probably not going to be a recession either. Ryan, when it comes to some of those opportunities that you are identifying right now, you just mentioned the outperformance, obviously, of the Magnificent 7 this year. Where do you see leadership coming from next year? Yeah, you think about it again, a year ago right now, right? Tech stocks were getting crushed. Magnificent 7, most of them were cut in half, if not more. 
What do you hate right now? People don't really like small caps as much. Now, maybe they do a little bit more because of the rally, but we like small and mid caps because we don't see a recession. We also see a Fed like the great discussion you just had. The Fed is probably done. We've been in that camp. Will they start cutting? Eh, maybe middle of next year. But again, if you don't have a recession and the Fed starts to cut, we think that small and mid caps and cyclicals in general, those are the areas we've been tilted to um, in the models we run for our Carson partners. We still like those areas. I mean, think about what's cheap. I mean, there's not a lot that's cheap out there. Small and mid caps are cheap relative to large caps on a historical basis. Ryan, if you do, though, see a mild recession, I know you're not expecting mm -hmm. him as some other strategists out there are forecasting a mild recession. Does that at all change where you're seeing the opportunity? I mean, sure, it would. I mean, again, we would probably want to shift a little more overweight to the more defensive areas. But what's the market telling us, right? We're seeing your defensive areas, your staples, utilities, a little bit of real estate still lagging. And that's normal for a healthy bull market. So until we see that change, it's hard to get overly um, cautious, I guess I'll say. Does the political environment that surrounds uh, <laughs> a lot of central banks <laughs> at this point going into a major general yeah. election year, not just here right. in the U.S., but in uh, certain other uh, developed nations around the world as well, you think about that. How do you layer that into your investment thesis? Yeah, I mean, believe me, central banks matter. Obviously, we just had a bunch of hikes. We saw what happened. And again, you know, I, I, let's talk about the election for a minute, right? I mean, pre-election years normally are pretty strong. Well, when you have a you know first-term president, as a piece of 20% on average. We talked about this, I think, like a year ago, to be honest. They were up 20%. When you go to the election year mm -hmm. of a first-term president, the last 10 have been higher. So election year has been higher the last 10 times with the first term president. There's lots of other factors. We're aware of that. But when the fundamentals are there, it is what it is. Washington can pull some certain levers to keep things moving. And we'd still think it's, um, you know, not a reason to be worried just because it's election year. I'll put it that way. Ryan, we're talking a lot about 2024, but what about December? Because I know oh, yeah. you do a lot just in terms of tracking the performance mm -hmm. historically and yeah. maybe how we are set up to perform. So what do those gains potentially look like over the next four weeks? Yeah, we think there's still some gains coming is the short answer. I mean, you think about it. What's the old saying, right? Don't short a dull market. And Jared and I were just talking about this a minute ago. The last five days, the S&P 500 has not gained or lost more than 45 basis points, 0.45%. What in the world does that mean? Well, that is not a lot of volatility. That's a dull market. The last time we saw that was April, almost seven months ago. Three months after that, the S&P gained 10%. Now, that's just one sample size. I get it. But this market, we're going to look at one of the best November gains ever. And now here we are just kind of going sideways. To us, it's like the market's catching its breath, which turns into December. December is usually strong, up 1.4% on average. No month is more likely to be higher. But a pre-election year, those returns actually double. And, you know, it is what it is. We still think there's some upside here um, for a year in chase. As so many people have been doubting this market just a month ago. Look what everybody was saying. And there's still a lot of reason to think there can be a chase into the end of this year. We always love the optimism from you, Ryan. I got to <laughs> tell you, there's always opportunity in your yeah. eyes, Ryan. Great yep. to have you here in studio. Thanks so much for stopping by. I do by. want to say my favorite Charlie Munger quote, yes, if please. I can, because that, that was a great discussion you guys had earlier. He said, you know, it's not supposed to be easy. If somebody finds it easy, they're probably stupid. I think that's a pretty good Charlie <laughs> quote. We are going to miss him. He's a legend. and I, I like that quote. So we thanks all, for having me, guys. We all so certainly many. will. Ryan, thank you so much again for stopping by the studio. Appreciate it. Well, let's talk a little Dollar Tree here as well this morning. Dollar Tree shares are falling this morning, and now they're up. They were falling. Now they're up by about four and a quarter percent. The discount retailer narrowing its full year guidance. Its consolidated net sales are now expected to range from $30.5 billion to $30.7 billion. That's down about $2 million from its previous outlook. And for this quarter, it missed earnings and sales expectations. There you're taking a look at some of these actuals versus the estimates. The company saying softer demand shrink. And and sales all impacting the outlook in this most recent quarter for Dollar General here. Um, and there you're taking a look at some of these segments here for same store net sales up uh, just shy of 8% for Dollar Tree and just shy of about 6% for Family Dollar. Yeah, Brad, we did see some trimming here just in terms of the guidance and what Dollar Tree sees down the line. But I do still think we just had those same store sales numbers up there on the screen. 5.4% increase at the flagship Dollar Tree, Dollar General up just about 2%. And that really shows the fact that consumers are trading down. Transaction counts are higher. They are growing traffic. People are pressed. They're trying doing everything they can to stretch those budgets. They're being forced to do things that they wouldn't have normally done just in terms of some of their spending patterns. So we're seeing some of these lower cost retailers like Dollar Tree, Dollar General, Walmart. We saw it in Walmart's earnings really benefit from this type of uh, macro environment, some of the weakness that we are seeing. Now, we also have to couch that, obviously, with the fact that consumers 
clearly are under a bit of pressure. Yeah. They're not spending as much as they certainly had been over the last couple of years. So any retailer you would think in this environment would feel some sort of pressure. Yeah, you think about how that's played out over the quarter for Dollar Tree, because even when we had our conversation uh, with Jamie Dimon in this most recent few weeks here, he had commented on the fact that there are going to be consumers that are still spending, but there are pressures that are starting to creep into the situation that's changing how they spend here, and specifically on some of the lower income cohorts, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon saying they don't have excess savings anymore and that the middle class is getting close to zero, no excess savings. So what does that mean for a company like Dollar Tree? Because they see even more of those, um, you know, income class cohorts start to make their way looking for deals in, in certain aisles and certain categories and uh, what that means for Dollar Tree is we could see even more of the expansions of some of the multi-price plus offerings. They did that to 870 additional Dollar Tree stores here and that is one way to add on to the overall mix um, and give them a little bit more price mix as well at the end of the day too where they could see margins. Certainly. All right. Well, Brad, let's take a look at another mover here that we're closely following this morning, and that's Okta Shares. Now, there's two stories that we're watching. First, the cybersecurity firm reporting earnings that were slightly uh, better than expected, slightly earlier than expected, raising its full-year sales target for 2024. Now, this upbeat earnings report coming after the company also disclosed that hackers stole all of its customer support user data back in October. Previously thought it had only impacted just 1% of customers. Now, the hackers downloaded a report that is thought to include names and email addresses of all of its users, customer data users there, other than a certain federal and Department of Defense systems. The company saying that the threat actor may use this information to target customers via phishing or social engineering attacks. Of course, that is uh, the warning there from Okta, just in terms of what exactly this information can be used for here down the line. We are seeing a bit of a reversal just in terms of shares or well off the lows, I should say. The stock had been off just over 10% shortly after this disclosure of the uh, wider than expected hack attack had been disclosed. Now we're looking at losses of just about four and a half percent. Now, I think the question though for CEO Todd McKinnon is how he's going to resource some of the trust in this brand because it has been damaged because of this attack. This is not the first time that Okta has been breached. And this is a company you and I were talking that prides itself on security. So clearly a massive issue you would think here for Okta, or at least an issue here in the short term. It's a major issue for the contracts that they do have because there's a certain part of those contracts that has a service level agreement, an SLA, and part of that service level agreement that Okta has to uphold is making sure that they're doing everything in their power and also making sure that they're mitigating attacks such as this one now as we're continuing to get even more about what took place within that. Some of the data that's also come out from the form of the company's earnings and the third quarter financial results, current remaining performance obligations, and that's that RPO figure that is that is in, increasingly important to remember for a lot of investors out there because it's essentially a number of factors, the timing of renewals, timing of purchases for additional capacity and all of that considered, that's a number where investors should be keeping a close eye on current remaining performance obligations. That actually grew 16% year over year to $1.83 billion. Any fluctuation in that as a result of what's come to light with regard to this uh, cybersecurity issue that the company has now disclosed, uh, that's going to be something quarter over quarter to keep a close eye on going forward. Also here, let's talk a little Las Vegas Sands shares. They are dropping this morning, and this comes after Mark Cuban is reportedly selling a, major, a majority stake of the Dallas Mavericks to Miriam Adelson, the largest shareholder of the Las Vegas Sands resort chain. Cuban said last year that he hopes to partner with LV Sands to move the Mavericks to a new arena that would be in the middle of a resort and casino. Adelson is paying for the stake at about $3.5 billion valuation. Good news for Mark Cuban, because guess what? He paid $285 million for the franchise back in 2000. I could not wait to talk about this story. We, we discussed it in our, in, in our morning meeting uh, and a few of the things, not just and, and aside from how much Mark Cuban is essentially realizing on his return on investment for this company, but the timing of this, amazingly important. We mentioned the fact that this is a potential move that we could see the Mavericks make at some point, uh, likely sometime around 2031. That's when the actual lease that they have in Dallas for the Mavericks stadium, that's when that runs out. And so in the absence of that, and Mark Cuban 
Cuban and has already said that it's a less than 50 percent chance that they find somewhere else. So he's already seeing what's in the water and saying, OK, well, Las Vegas could be a good new home for the Dallas Mavericks. This could be a good time for me to cash out. Mark Cuban has done an amazing job of really turning around the Mavericks organization, giving them an international type of prominence. When you think about Dirk Nowitzki and how he is one of the European kind of uh, Hall of Fame staples in the league's history here um, and giving the Dallas Mavericks that first championship as well. So Mark Cuban, Dirk Nowitzki, and the prominence that we had seen been able to come to the Dallas Mavericks franchise, getting that valuation up over years. Mark Cuban being one of the more outspoken, I will generously say, owners that's out there, and for, for good reason, too. And bringing, I would say, a lot, other, a lot of other tech founders, CEOs, and people who have a lot of weight to throw around on the capital side into the league and investing more and making these teams think more about how they can be technologically savvy, how they can also grow out the business savvy of many of their players, too. I think he's been able to do that and change the entire fabric of the way that the league thinks about its players, the coll uh, collective bargaining agreement, and that relationship. I, I think he's done a great job of that, and hopefully this new ownership, too, um, even if they were to move to Las Vegas, where they've already got some great teams. Um, you know, I hope that continues for them. Yeah, certainly. I mean, Mark Cuban has, in all aspects, really been the face of the Dallas Mavericks here yes. over the last several years. Might as well and be he has logo. done a tremendous <laughs> job just in terms of transforming the team, everything that you just said. And it's also good news here just in terms of maybe what this could mean for the Mavericks going forward. And I say that because Mark Cuban, he's not going anywhere anytime soon. He still owns a smaller stake here in the company. He's going mm -hmm. to run the basketball operation. So he's still going to be very involved with the Mavericks, at least for right now. And Miriam Adelson, if, if our viewers maybe aren't as familiar with that name. Now, she is the widow. She was married to Sheldon Adelson, who had died just about two years ago, and he was the founder of Las Vegas Sands. And so she inherited over half the shares, 56% of the shares of Las Vegas Sands when he did pass. So she's using some of that money, selling $2 billion worth, you said, of the stock here, in terms of uh, funding this uh this uh, buying of the stake here from this uh, purchase, I should say, from Mark Cuban. So exactly what this means, and if the Dallas Mavericks could be headed into Las Vegas, <sighs> that's the talk right now. They'd be joining the Aces. The <laughs> they the would be joining the Aces. Aces. who just won the their Oakland WNBA Oakland A's are going there, too. Las yeah. Vegas Raiders are there. There's teams out the there. The Knights. The Knights, the Golden Knights. And they certainly have a loyal fan base. It didn't take long for that to happen. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
At the age of 99 years old, Berkshire Hathaway's Charlie Munger has passed away, leaving behind a legacy in investment and business, livened by his long-term relations with some of the more prominent U.S. companies. One such company is wholesaler Costco and his personal relationship with the company's CEO. We want to bring Yahoo Finance's Brooke De Palma, who has been digging into this. And Brooke, what can you tell us just about this longtime, very special relationship between these two leaders? Yeah, very special relationship indeed. Uh, Munger actually joined the board in 1997, actually after Costco asked Warren Buffett to join the board. Warren Buffett then declined, and Munger joined the team back in 1997. He first came across the wholesaler retailer when uh, through Soul Price, the founder of Price Club, which then eventually merged with Costco. Now, Costco CEO did tell Yahoo Finance over the phone, quote, he was a legend to me, a tremendous asset to Costco. And I think that just speaks volumes. I actually have chills just reading that. It speaks volumes to the relationship that they had and really how Munger played an incremental role in the evolution of Costco. Until the very end, Charlie did stay loyal to Costco. Earlier this year, he said, quote, I'm a total addict and I'm never going to sell a share. And most recently, when asked why he liked the Costco model, he said Costco really did sell cheaper than anybody else in America. And they did it in these big, efficient stores, kept all the people who didn't like to do big volumes out and gave points to those who did. And as you could see here, uh, Munger did have a significant stake in Costco. As of Tuesday's close, that stake was worth $111 million. And that's only behind CEO Craig uh, as well. It goes to show how close those relationships were with many of the companies that they invested in here. Munger was not only a fan of the company, was but was also known for being a significant stakeholder in the wholesaler, as you were just mentioning on the screen there. So those those relationships, they run deep when you yeah. hear about all of the conversations that they've had, how executives have poured into them, and they, for Munger and Buffett, how they've poured into executives and led their strategy, too. Right. And it's important to note here that Munger kept his stake in the company even after Berkshire Hathaway exited stake in 2020 after selling 4.3 million shares. And so Munger continued to remain so loyal to the brand. It's important to note he also played an incremental role in bringing Costco to China. There they have five locations there now. They did that back in 2019. Once again, he was on the board at that time when they eventually made the decision to go to China. He really pushed for that. And he also, you know, anecdotally said that he liked the way that Costco went to what he said was rich, where rich people lived while Walmart didn't. And so he liked the way that Costco played the game in order to uh, develop a very loyal audience that Costco has today. Oh, it's quite the game over at Costco for quite sure. Quite the game, quite <laughs> the game. When you're running up and down those aisles trying to get some free samples, man, it's it quite the <laughs> but game. But that's what people co keeps co people coming back and certainly yeah, cuts Munger on the line as well. Yeah. Brooke, thanks so much. Appreciate it. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Big day uh, for General Motors, outlining a 33% hike in its dividend and a $10 billion new stock buyback plan. Here with a special guest right now, GM Chair and CEO Mary Barr. Mary, good to see you. It feels like we should be doing this interview in a, an E-Ray, or a Corvette E-Ray, not in this conference room. That would be a lot of fun, for All right. sure. All right, next time. And then go for a drive. All right, fair enough, next time. So let's start on this two $10 billion buyback. Mm -hmm. Is this a bet on your future being a profitable one from an electric vehicle standpoint? It's, it's a, uh, a bet on us not only being profitable, but generating cash flow from our strong internal combustion engine business, uh, a growing EV business, a growing software business, and then when we ch uh, chart the course from an autonomous vehicle perspective. So it is demonstrating our confidence in our strategy and our ability, ability to grow, generate free ca cash flow, as well as strong margins. This is a really big number, Mary. Uh, very headline grabbing. Why do you think you needed to do this and send that message to investors? Well, I think we're not happy. I personally am not happy with where the share price is. And I think, you know, when we look at what we've been through from a from COVID, from semiconductor shortages, and then from the uncertainty around the uh, UAW strike and the, the, you know, the labor situation more broadly, we are we have certainty now. And we always have had a capital allocation framework, and our, our target cash um, was up on average around 18 to $20 uh, billion. And so when you look at that and you look at the cash that we had, we thought this was the right thing to do to return it to our owners. When you're out there talking to investors, what's their, some of their biggest concerns? Because I've talked a lot with your CFO, Paul Jacobson, mm -hmm. and every time I talk to him, the outlook is better than expected. The guidance has been raised before the UAW situation. What have investors been missing? Well, I think investors... Uh, Investors like certainty, and I think until we got the agreement ratified with the UAW and with Unifor in Canada, I think that was an important milestone. Um, I'm disappointed this year that we haven't delivered more Altium-based EVs out into the marketplace. Uh, that's not a, uh, an issue with the Altium platform in general. It was really an automation issue that we will be working our way out of. Uh, we, we've made progress. We'll, each quarter we'll continue to make progress, and we'll be out of that by the middle of next year. I think, but demonstrate it. We've got to execute. We've got to prove that we're going to have EVs people want to buy. I'm confident. And then, you know, with the recent incidents at Cruise, we've got to demonstrate what the right path forward, and we will. I think when we do those and continue to demonstrate that we're going to have growth, strong cash flow, strong margins, I think, uh, you know, they'll believe. Uh, and I think this was uh, sending a very strong signal that we have confidence that we will. You're an engineer by training, Mary. For the lay person out there, actually, such as myself, why is it so hard to scale up EV production in this country? Well, I think there's, it, first of all, there's a lot of, you know, when you think about the base of the vehicle, uh, the, the foundation, uh, and the most important part of an electric vehicle is the battery, the battery uh, pack. And, you know, that's new, uh, new, a whole new process of pulling that together. You know, we were uh, one of the leaders uh, setting aside, uh, or I'd say in addition to Tesla, of doing a dedicated platform with Altium. And we've had a lot of learnings. We're making it better as we go. We'll continue to take cost out. Uh, but frankly, you know, what's holding us up now is is something that um, we we just I think we're we're rushing and we uh, needed to take the right have the right people and I've made all those changes to get that done. Are you still able to achieve what was a low single digit profit margin for EVs by 2025? That that is what we've indicated and that's the plan that we're executing. How, longer term, how do you take go from those margins for EVs to something that ICE or the or the internal combustion engines make? Well, I think, um, one, when you look at the cost of doing an internal combustion engine vehicle continues to get higher with the compliance requirements. Also, IRA, I think, allows us to get there more quickly. But we've always said, um, you know, later in this decade that we were going to see parity uh, on those, and that's the pl plan that we're working to. So how do we get there? It's going to be to continue to improve the battery technology and continuing to make the whole vehicle more efficient. And we've already made uh, dramatic steps in that direction, and we'll continue to roll that out. 2035, are you still making gas-powered cars? Well, we have said our, our vision, our plan is to have uh, all light-duty vehicles be EV by 2035. And so that's, uh, that's the plan in the portfolio that we're executing. Ultimately, the customer decides, and we have flexibility as we can toggle in, in plants today and we'll continue to have the ability to toggle between uh, EV and AV, but we do believe in an all-EV future and we'll be more than ready to go with light-duty by 2035. You, I mean, GM, some of your competitors have put out some really good electric cars. Demand has seemed to slow down a little bit. 
Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think uh, demand, the growth rate has slowed down, but, but EV adoption is still growing. And so when you think about it, though, a lot of the EVs that are out on the road today, they either don't tick all the boxes that a consumer is looking for. I think that's why I'm excited about the GM EVs that we have coming out, whether it's from Chevrolet, GMC, GMC Hummer, Cadillac. I'm very excited, and that's why I want to get them in volume to demonstrate that a customer doesn't have to give anything up when they, when they buy an electric vehicle. I also think affordability, and when you look at the Chevrolet Blazer EV and the Chevrolet Equinox EV, as well as the Bolt that we're going to bring back on the LTM platform that's been very successful and customers love it in 2025, I think we're going to really get at that affordability issue. And during this whole period, what we'll also see is continued expansion of the charging infrastructure. Those are what need to happen, because to get to you know growth beyond um, a million units, but two, three, four, when you look at the SAR, you know, a 15 to 17 million SAR, you've got to reach that customer that only owns one vehicle. And they need it to do everything for them, and they need to count on it. And that's why all those elements are so important to get to widespread EV adoption. I think it's coming. We never thought it was going to be a straight line. It's going to have ups and downs. We've seen that in other markets that are ahead of the U.S. in EV adoption, but it will come. When you talk to consumers, is the thing still holding them back on EVs range anxiety? Not so much. I mean, we, the magic number is 300. When you get to 300 miles of range on a charge, that's when the consumer, uh, you know, has confidence from a range perspective. They still want to know. They don't want to have. They don't want to replace that with charge anxiety. So they want to know when they get to a charger, it's going to be available and it's going to work. And there's a tremendous amount of work going on on that as well. Uh, but uh, I, and I think those are things that the consumer worries about. But that's why we've. Uh, you know, really worked hard to make sure that we have offerings above 300 miles, 300 or above across the portfolio entries we have in EVs. Also working hard has been the Biden administration to roll out infrastructure. And we've talked at length recently with uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg uh, at length really about charging stations and building more. What grade would you put on the health of our network? I, I have chargers by me, Mary, full stop, that just don't work. Well, I think, the, and that's one of the things with the partners we're working with, it's not just to have them there, they have to work. And so the partners that we're working with, we're measuring them on reliability uh, and availability and that they're, you know, how quickly if there's an issue, they get that resolved. I think, uh, you know, the uh, work we did with Tesla to leverage their charging network and even adopting the, the North American charging standard, I think, uh, you know, overnight doubled the amount of uh, charging uh, infrastructure state or charging stations our customers will have uh, as we get into next year. We also th did a very significant um, charging arrangement with pilot, the pilot company. When you think about Pilot Flying J, uh, as you're making a road trip, you want to know that the charger is going to be available for you there. And the fact that it's at a station that's going to have someone there that knows like that, if it's not, I think is going to be important as well. So it will come. You mentioned Tesla. They have a big day coming tomorrow. They're rolling out a square box type SUV. I don't know how other way to put it. Is that Cybertruck, do you see that as a, a competitor, a true competitor to like the Silverado or the truck that you make? Well, you know, I, I think when we look at our uh, truck portfolio from an EV perspective, uh, first of all, the Hummer truck is a super truck. Really nice. Uh, it's, it's an incredible vehicle to drive. And uh, again, the, the radius of turns, et cetera, it's, it's a lot of fun. But then right now we have the Silverado EV work truck out. Uh, as we get into next year, we'll have the RST, the, the more retail version of that, along with uh, shortly thereafter the uh, uh, GMC Sierra EV coming. When I look at our truck portfolio and where we stand with trucks today and the capability of those trucks from what customers really care about, I'm very confident that we've got a winning strategy from a truck perspective in the EV market. You don't sound worried about this. Well, I always take every every competitor extremely seriously. And so we'll watch as it evolves. But again, I think we know trucks. And when I look at the trucks, the feedback that we're getting from the fleet customers already gives me confidence in our truck portfolio. What's your sense of demand? Uh, interest rates are much, much higher year over year. Uh, consumers are battling with a couple extra hundred dollars a month in student loan payments. How do you have you been uh, reading it lately? Well, you know, it's something that we watch very, very carefully of where demand is going to be. We, we don't, you know, it's hard to say. There's so many knobs, as you mentioned, that are turning. Uh, but I think key to uh, going through whatever the demand is going to be is to having the right products and having them priced appropriately. And the strength of our products, we're below uh, the industry average from an incentive perspective. And the discipline that we have, uh, I think, uh, is going to be how, how we move through next year, regardless of where the consumer is. Before we let you go, a lot of focus, investor focus, on the outlook for crude. Mm -hmm. What is your commitment to that business? 
Well, um, first of all, I think we have uh, the progress that the cruise team has made has been incredible. We have a really strong technical team. Obviously, I, you know, we've shared that we're doing an independent review of the incident. We already know we need to be more transparent and have the right relationship with regulators. That's something GM knows how to do and, and believes is extremely important. So we're already on that path to start rebuilding those relationships and that trust with transparency. Uh, but then also we're doing a safety review and an overall technology review. And when we complete that, that will guide us in the path forward. But I think we have to step back and look at how significant this technology is from a societal perspective. Not only safer than a human driver, and we've learned it's got to be significantly safer than a human driver, but also when you think about people who right now don't can't drive for whatever reason, giving them mobility because mobility is freedom. So we will be, uh, and we also have said though, we'll be measured as we roll out, which is going to give us the ability to be more cost effective. Uh, and like I said, we'll share when the reviews are done what our plan forward do you, is. Lastly, do you still see on a t an autonomous future? I, I do. I, I do see an autonomous future. And again, we'll be guided by what we learn and what's the right thing to do from a rollout, from a re responsible, from a capital perspective as well. All right, next time we're doing this in an E-Ray. Mary Barr, good to see you in person for a change. Uh, GM, Chair and CEO, thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. All right, guys, back to you. All right, Saz, thanks so much for bringing us that conversation. Of course, our thanks to Mary Barra as well. Well, General Motors is a trending ticker today on Yahoo Finance. Shares are jumping up over 11% after the company announced a $10 billion stock buyback and a 33% increase to its quarterly dividend. Now, GM CEO Mary Barra just sitting down there with Brian Zazi talking a lot just about the UAW agreement, the agreement that has been ratified, she called it an important milestone. She did, though, go on to say she talked a little bit about EV adoption, and she said that she is a little bit disappointed in terms of this year that they haven't seen more EVs delivered into the marketplace. I also touched on some issues as to why that is and what needs to happen to better propel some of that EV growth transition. So we want to bring in Greg Migliori. He's the editor-in-chief of Autoblog. And Greg, it's great to see you. I know you were just listening in uh, to the conversation that Brian Sazi was having there with Mary Barra. I'm curious if we could start on that EV transition part of the conversation because she did bring up some issues just in terms of meeting customer expectations. She also went on to say affordability is still an issue. Infrastructure is still an issue. I'm curious what you make of GM's push there, the fact that they haven't been as successful as they have wanted to be up, up until this point with EV and what is needed to really, or I guess, what is the necessary catalyst in order to really boost that adoption? Good morning. So right now, General Motors, I think, is well positioned to capitalize on the EV market when there is some growth in that area. Right now, we're looking at like 7.8% of the total U.S. Uh, car sales uh, are EVs. That's fairly small. And there's a lot of players in there right now that have very credible products. Now, General Motors could answer with the Chevy Blazer EV, the Chevy Equinox EV, Hummer, Cadillac, uh, higher up the price portfolio as far as vehicles that are very competitive. They're powered by the Altium battery pack. So they're well positioned to sort of capitalize on this, uh, this segment once consumers get there. Some things are out of their control, things like charging, things like government incentives, things like just general, the mood of the public. So right now, I think they're in a good position to capitalize, perhaps when that day comes, uh, but they're in a bit of a holding pattern. We have a clip of what CEO Mary Barr was actually saying about the, the EV transition as well as what that demand profile looks like. I want to play that clip for some of our viewers here and then get to a question on the other side for you, Greg. Well, we have said our, our vision, our plan is to have uh, all light duty vehicles be EV by 2035. And so that's, uh, that's the plan in the portfolio that we're executing. Ultimately, the customer decides and we have flexibility as we can toggle in, in plants today and we'll continue to have the ability to toggle between uh, EV and AV. But we do believe in an all EV future and we'll be more than ready to go with light duty by 2035. And I believe where the conversation went next after that, Greg, where I'd love to get some of your thought on is, is at what margin profile would we see some of these light duty EVs move into the market here? And would that ever be comparable to what they're expecting or at least have for decades expected and delivered upon on the ICE side of the business? I think it's going to take several years for some of these vehicles to achieve those type of margins. If you look at vehicles like the Chevy Silverado, uh, the Chevy Tahoe, GMC Yukon, hugely profitable vehicles that uh, are sold in you know 
wide varieties to a lot of different people. It's going to take a while for things like a Chevy Blazer EV, for example, to achieve that type of scale and thus that type of profitability. I think they're going to be working on that for the rest of the decade, at least. And then when you get to 2035, which is their stated goal, I think at that point you will see some, uh, you're going to have to see uh, much better margins because that will be at that point the true basis of the company, of General Motors as an entity going forward. Now, a lot could change before that time. The, the infrastructure is still an amazing, challenging question. It's something that right now there isn't a great solution to. There's also things that could change you know, politically. If you know, there were to be a different president next year, four years after that, the entire landscape could change as far as you know, how the government is supporting EVs. So there could be potentially some headwinds for General Motors and all automakers as well. There's a lot of uncertainty right now in this space. Craig, speaking of some of the uncertainty within this space, I think a lot of people are waiting to see exactly what the adoption rate is going to look like on the Cybertruck that is being announced and rolled out here uh, from Tesla. Mary Barra did briefly comment on that. She was saying that she is, though, still confident that GM has a winning strategy in the EV truck market. I'm curious, are, do you view the Cybertruck as a threat here to GM and some of the more traditional automakers when you compare what we're seeing with the Cybertruck to some of their offerings within the EV pickup space? So from a head-to-head -head truck standpoint, I don't necessarily view it as a true threat because it's sort of a different thing. It's almost like a lifestyle vehicle. It's a design statement. I think it's a very attractive vehicle. I, I know a lot of other people don't necessarily feel that way, but it's stainless steel. It's wedge-shaped. It has some like almost like Tron-shaped design cues going back to, say, the 1980s. I think it can be pretty cool. The challenge there is going to be the execution. How is the fit and finish? We've heard a lot of mixed reviews about how the final products are coming together. Elon Musk himself has said prototypes aren't that hard, uh, but building the vehicle's production is actually very difficult. And I think you're going to see that with the Cybertruck. Uh, General Motors, Ford, Stellantis, they're well positioned with electrified versions of the Silverado, of the Ram, of the F-150. So I don't think it's a direct threat because I also feel like, again, the Cybertruck is almost something different. It's going to attract more than just traditional truck buyers. Uh, it's going to you know, attract people who are just interested in that type of vehicle. Uh, Tesla says they have, I think, a million orders. Uh, that's like four years of a, a backlog. So uh, hmm. we'll see how that all plays out. Yeah. Does it even crab walk, though, Greg? That's the question. I mean, <laughs> look, we got to leave things here on the day. Is, is there a price point, though, where the Cybertruck is a bust, potentially? I don't actually think so. I think there's a very, you know, aggressive base of Tesla buyers that uh, are going to probably be willing to pay whatever they want for it. But then the the question is, how do they win over the mainstream buyer that maybe right. wants to spend $60,000? Exactly. We'll see. Greg Migliori, who is the Autoblog Editor-in-Chief. Greg, always a pleasure to get some of your time, insights, and perspective. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Well, let's get back to Foot Locker here this morning. Reporting its Q3 earnings today, beating the street expectations. Shoe retailer also raising its fiscal full-year guidance. For more on the biggest takeaways from the report, Yahoo Finance's own Brooke De Palma is here. Look, none of us are wearing sneakers here today, but we're all ready to chat. <laughs> we're counting on you. And... We're counting on you, Brad. Uh, I didn't do it today. I didn't do it today. But I'm sorry. <laughs> Bull shares are moving higher this morning, up more than 14% in the early hours after Foot Locker posted better than feared results here, both earnings and revenue beating on both the top and bottom line. Same source sales did decline by 8%, but that was higher than the down 10% that Wall Street had expected. And on the call, the the executive said the traffic remained down year over year, but customers did respond to September and October promotional efforts that were made by the company. Now, Foot Locker did narrow its 2023 full year guidance. Sales now are expected to come in between eight to eight and a half percent. That's compared to the previous range of eight to nine percent. Adjusted earnings per share expected to come in at a dollar thirty to a dollar forty. That's compared to a dollar thirty and to a dollar fifty. That was previously expected. But executives did say on the call that they were encouraged by early results in early November as well as Black Friday. There they saw solid traffic. They also noted that customers are discerning and event driven. They're seeking deals, but they're also willing to pay up for full price items and innovation as well as on-trend items one of those on-trend items 
Uggs, the Tasman mm. slippers, doing well for them. And as you could see, your inventory, a woe of last holiday season, now is up 10.5%, more than analysts expected. But the company did say that that includes about 6% impact from the strategic pull forward of inventory to best position themselves for this holiday. That inventory level does include mostly footwear. They said that apparel is only up slightly, but they do expect to end the year with inventory flat to slightly down. And so lots of different takeaways from Foot Locker is that Foot Lock, a footwear category continues to remain pressured. Gotta say, I did not know that they sold Uggs. Mm. They do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I Fox actually didn't know the resurgence of the Tasman popularity. Slippers, they yeah. get a big hit this season. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right, well, if anybody spots any Grimace Crocs out there, let me know so, for sure. We'll talk later. You, what? No. Oh, my goodness. All right, <laughs> thanks so much, Brooke. We gotta keep it moving here on the morning. Consumers, they're flocking to Foot Locker as big discounts boost the company's holiday sales. But Wall Street still doesn't seem to be a big fan of the footwear retailer. Uh, for a deeper dive into Foot Locker's earnings, we're joined by Janine Stichter, who is the Managing Director and Consumer Retail and Lifestyle Brands Analyst over at BTIG. Uh, great to have you here with us. Uh, you know, as we're continuing to keep an eye on Foot Locker, we were talking about this earlier today. There are some weak spots in the report here, but ultimately shares up by about 15%. What do you think is the main takeaway that investors are zeroing in on here after the earnings? Yeah, I think it all needs to kind of be put in context of the broader environment. As you mentioned, these results are still very challenged and their comps were down 8% in the quarter, but up against a backdrop where I think a lot of analysts and investors were expecting them to have to lower their annual guidance, this is a relatively better result. And I think the important thing to call out here is, whereas for most companies who've reported through the Q3 reporting cycle saw a deceleration from August into September into October, Foot Locker actually saw the opposite, where their trends were relatively consistent in August and September, down high single digits, but they actually saw an improvement in October, down mid single digits, and it sounds like Black Friday was off to a good, a good start for the holidays for them. Janine, how reliant are they still going to be on promotional activity? And when, when we look beyond the holiday season, what do you see that promotional activity looking like in 2024? Yeah, I think that's one thing that makes it a little bit challenging to understand what the underlying fundamentals look like for this business. They're still working through an elevated inventory position. So they were very promotional, especially as you got into October and November, as we got into the holiday season. So that definitely drove some of the improved conversion for them. I do think the promotions will start to improve um, once we get through the holidays. And that's all kind of relying on the inventory position, which they called out being flat to down slightly um, to finish the year. And also just what we're seeing in the environment where inventory is still a bit elevated, but we are seeing it come cleaner and athletic. It's been heavy throughout the whole year, but we're finally starting to get to a point where we're at an equilibrium with the inventory levels in the athletic in the athletic industry. You know, we have one of our faithful viewers who chimed in and I think made a very good point in tweeting at us during the show, talking about some of the inventory and what this could potentially spell through for some other earnings, and, and notably Nike here too. Is there any kind of pull through from what you've seen on the inventory front and the discounting, the promotions that Foot Locker has implemented that could impact to even a company that's typically reporting later on in the season um, and where overproduction might have taken place in some instances here. Yeah, well, I think we've heard it from Nike already that what they're talking about is where they, where they got over inventory last year, they're being much more tighter in their distribution to the market. So I think we'll see them continue to return to a more full price cadence. We heard a bit from that uh, from them when they reported their last quarter. And I think we'll continue to hear that where they will be reducing the amount of inventory they put out into the market and just being a little bit more judicious in their distribution um, as they think about where they put their product. Janine, some of the new partnerships or plans for growth are looking more international. They have a plan to uh, operate in India next year when it comes to the uh, building on the relationship with the NBA. Now, Foot Locker is going to be a marketing partner here in the U.S. How big of a catalyst do you see maybe those two partnerships being here for Foot Locker when we're talking about this turnaround plan and the transition that's taking place under Mary Dillon? Yeah, I think the NBA partnership is particularly important. Uh, they already have really high brand awareness. Everyone knows Foot Locker, but this kind of serves to elevate the brand awareness further. And I think what it does for them is it allows them to go deeper into basketball. And as I think about the strategy for next year and the years beyond, it really hinges on continuing to become the go-to source for, for, for the basketball category, which is really their bread and butter. It's their sweet spot. And this kind of further reinforces that relationship. With the India entry, it's it's interesting. I think it's not particularly meaningful right now, but I think it could potentially reflects a broader strategy where they have opportunity to expand internationally. And the important thing here is that it's a license agreement. So it's not capital intensive. They're putting their capital into refreshing their stores in the U.S., but there's still an opportunity to leverage the brand awareness they have, leverage a growing uh, footwear market internationally without having to put a lot of um, capital outlay towards it. 
Janine, um, I, I don't want to admit how much time I spend in Foot Locker on a weekly basis, but I got to check out what the kids are wearing and hope to, hope to stay on trend. At the end of the day, though, the number of stores that they have, is this a base or a profile of stores uh, on, on the counts that they have at this point in time that you expect to see dramatically reduced or, if not repositioned, perhaps, in to other areas where foot traffic continues to remain strong, uh, considering that many of these stores, like I had grown up going to the mall, were annexed to the mall experience. Yeah, I think what we'll see is more of a repositioning. They've already done a lot of the heavy lifting on closing their underperforming mall-based mall stores. We'll see more of that in the coming years, but we'll see that square footage um, net actually growing because we're seeing it shifting towards off-mall locations where we're seeing more of the traffic. So I think when you think of this story and this company three to five years out, the plan is to be about 50% off mall, um, where the traffic is really gravitating towards, and where they can also open larger stores. And the larger stores are important because it allows them to better showcase some of the newer brands they're bringing in and allows them to better showcase the apparel. They can really become a one-stop shop for footwear, for apparel, for the whole family, something that's harder to do in a smaller mall-based box. All right, Locker shares up just about 17% right now in early trading. Janine Stichter, great to have you here, Managing Director and Consumer Retail and Lifestyle Brands Analyst with BTIG. Thanks, Janine. Thank you. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. Stay tuned. Is Christmas coming early this year? The markets are trading like it is. The last two trading days have been the most narrow since Christmas Eve 2019. And the VIX, the street's new favorite fear gauge, well, not new at all, it's just the favorite fear gauge. We're taking a look at that here. It's up by about eight tenths of a percent intraday. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance reporter, Jared Blickery. Thanks so much, Jared. Thank you, Brad. The markets are boring, and this is something that we expect in later December, coming a little bit earlier this year. But as you said, this is the narrowest two-day range, uh, Monday, excuse me, Friday and Monday, going back to Christmas Eve uh, 2019. And you can see the, the lower this number, the less volatility there is, and that contrasts cr pretty sharply with a lot of the volatility that we saw in prior years. And uh, we just had Ryan Dietrich over at Carson come in today, had a couple of comments on the S&P 
S&P 500 yesterday by Twitter. This is a year-to-date look, and here is this huge run-up we've had. But yesterday, uh, Ryan Dietrich was saying, today will likely be the fifth day in a row that the S&P 500 does not gain or lose more than 45 basis points. That's just under half a percent. You'd have to go back more than seven months to the last time that happened. That would be April 12th. What's that thing they say about shorting a dull market? I will answer that. Do not short a dull market because it can go up uh, on a relatively steady basis longer than a lot of people can remain solvent. Now, I just want to show another tweet by Ryan from a couple of weeks ago, and this was quite prescient. Average year for the S&P 500 since 1950 bottoms today shows a nifty chart, and here it is, and here's the expected run into the end of the year. And just bringing it back to what actually happened after that, guess what? That was the low, so pretty impressive there. And another way to look at seasonality, and seasonality has worked very well this year, is in the VIX. Now, the cyan line here up top, this is what uh, happens going all the way back to 1990. It's an average, and this purple line is what's happened this year. Uh, we did get a little bit of a late signal uh, in October, but the overall gist is that we expect volatility to decline into the end of the year. And by the way, that is already happening, if you've been, uh, been paying attention here. Uh, let me just close with a look at the VIX. Um, I was looking at volatility in the Treasury market uh, an hour ago, but now I want to take a look at the VIX, and we'll see if I can get a max chart going back to 1990s. We have now dipped a bit definitively below the 15 mark here, the 15 handle in the VIX. This has happened three times in the past, and you notice when it does, that tends to happen, that tends to occur for a number of years. So extrapolating that, you'd have to think, well, are we going to be in this massive bull market for a number of years? I think it's way too early to tell, but really interesting to point out this fact here, and it's just been a year, a year of uh, the market just defying expectations. So why not, I say? It certainly has, and we'll see whether or not that continues to hold. All right, Jared, thanks. Well, Dollar Tree releasing its third quarter earnings, and it was disappointing results here to a degree after missing on its earnings and sales expectations. The company also trimmed its full year guidance. Now, the company is saying that softer demand shrink and also the sales mix all impacting the outlook here for the company. For more, we want to bring in Brad Thomas. He's KeyBank's Managing Director and Equity Research Analyst. Joining us now for more, and Brad, when you take a look at these results, let's start with the guidance and what we heard there from the company in terms of this stock, many of it Dollar Tree, many of its competitors being better positioned in this current economic environment. How do you stack up the results to your expectations? Sure. So I think it was a very mixed quarter, as you as you mentioned. Uh, but I think what's carrying the day here is, number one, low expectations for all retailers going into this earnings season. We've been warning going back to, to June that this could be a soft holiday season, uh, particularly as student loans kicked in, as inflation continues to weigh on ability to spend. Uh, and so, so again, I think low expectations going in, uh, but that fourth quarter guidance from an earnings standpoint, you know, was certainly encouraging, uh, primarily being driven by ongoing strength at the Dollar Tree banner that continues to show some nice share gains uh, as a result of them having broken the buck and, and rolling out more multi-price items. Brad, perhaps you can help us make some sense of what many investors might be thinking in that if you did see cracks in the consumer, and, and we're beginning to see just that, that Dollar Tree would be an assumed beneficiary. What is the thinking about what's actually prevailed in this figures and, and what the company is saying about going forward uh, that is actually giving us a little bit more inclination into how we should be thinking about Dollar Tree, even in that type of consumer environment? You know, leading up to this year, uh, one had thought that the Dollar Trees were, uh, the, the Dollar Stores uh, were a segment that really could outperform during times that the consumer was under duress. Uh, but I think what's been different is uh, we've been seeing pressure on the low end consumer while the unemployment rate has still held up relatively well. Um, I, I think what may still be on the horizon is if we see pressure in the job market, then you see more of a middle income consumer trade down into the Dollar Stores. And we haven't necessarily been seeing a lot of that yet. I think what really stood out in terms of, of uh, weakness right now from a cyclical standpoint on the business uh, was that discretionary category at the family dollar banner. Uh, that was down about 12%. Uh, and, and that really is, is synonymous with what we're seeing at, at many other retailers where the discretionary categories are under pressure. So as you look at longer term, uh, I think there maybe is some reason for optimism for, for patient investors to say uh, that, that 
Dollar Tree and the dollar stores in general could benefit from a cyclical recovery as you look out longer term. And that longer term uh, time horizon that you have, I guess more specifically, what does that look like? Are we talking about 12 months from now, 18 months from now? What should investors be preparing for? Sure. Look, we, we think that the, the holidays are going to be tough. We think that the first half of next year is still certainly tough. And, and the big wild card is, is when does the Fed end up starting to cut rates and when can that you know, uh, reignite the economy here? Um, uh, otherwise, we think things may still grind along and, and potentially keep slowing. Uh, what's interesting, though, as you look out longer term, uh, is Dollar Tree also has a number of company-specific initiatives that they think can continue to drive growth at Dollar Tree uh, and reinvigorate the family dollar uh, banner. Uh, and so they're targeting $10 in earnings in 2026. Now, right now, I think there's still a lot of question marks around whether they can they can truly turn around family dollar. But if they're able to hit that $10 number, uh, then we think that they could, that could drive this stock ultimately as high as $200. How much of that turnaround also hinges on some of the frozen and refrigerated items that they're continuing to bring into the storefronts, particularly at those three, the four, the $5 price ranges here? Yeah, I think that's a really exciting opportunity at Dollar Tree. Uh, if you remember, uh, if you went back a little over a year ago, I mean, everything in the store was $1. They had tested a few multi-price items. Uh, but what we saw last year at the beginning of 2022 uh, was them breaking the buck, going to $1.25 on the entire store, and then, of course, really starting to push more and more of the multi-price items, these three, four, five dollar items. And and what's so compelling about those items is they're is they're different items and they're better items. Uh, you know, you could get uh, 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 pizza, other refrigerated goods that could help feed a whole family which really couldn't have been offered in those stores when it was at just a $1 price point. So we think that's going to be a nice driver going forward of that mid-single-digit comp that the company's targeting uh, in the Dollar Tree banner. Um, you know, it's, it's more so on the family dollar side where there's much more competition. Uh, this quarter, 82% of sales were clocking in at consumables, uh, and they're facing a lot more competition from Walmart uh, you know, within that banner right now. Yeah, in terms of that competition from Walmart, some of their other bigger rivals, how do you see, I guess, what do you think Dollar Tree can do in order to fend off some of that competition and stop losing maybe some of that market share? Look, I think that's the big risk um, from a competitive standpoint as we look out uh, over the next, you know, three to five years. Um, Walmart's always been the low price leader but what I think is different about Walmart right now is how great their e-commerce business is and how many Americans are recognizing that they don't necessarily have to drive to a Walmart store. They can get it delivered and recognize all those savings uh, without, again, having to sp spend the gas. All right. Thanks so much for joining us here. Excellent analysis as always. Brad Thomas, KeyBank Managing Director and Equity Research Analyst, helping us break down Dollar Tree as well as the state of the consumer here right now. Appreciate it, Brad. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Tesla will deliver its first production version of its Cybertruck to customers on Thursday in Austin, Texas, ahead of the EV giant's first new vehicle in almost four years. Here's everything you need to know. A starting price of $40,000 was announced back in 2019, with two higher performance models that would cost $50,000 and $60,000. However, those prices were removed from the Cybertruck website in 2021, and an official price has been difficult to find. His goal is to make it affordable for regular folks. If you look at the pickup truck market in the US, the EV pickup truck, they're super expensive. So it's gonna be challenging to make this thing profitable given how technologically advanced it is. Tesla received over 250,000 reservations for the Cybertruck within a week of its unveiling. The Cybertruck currently has over 1.5 million existing reservations. Some people think this would be a niche vehicle platform. I don't think so. You know, if I was Ford, who's, you know, they're already cutting the production shift at the F-150 Lightning plant in Detroit. You know, I, I'd see more trouble coming for them ahead as the Cybertruck rolls out. 
Some specs were highly publicized, like shatter-resistant glass and a stainless steel exterior. The Cybertruck allegedly has a towing capacity of 11,000 pounds, 1,000 pounds more than Ford's F-150 Lightning, and 2,500 pounds of payload capacity. Although the Cybertruck's frunk the nickname given to the extra storage space in the front of EVs where an engine would go appears to be smaller than the F-150 Lightning. Tesla CEO Elon Musk said during an October third quarter earnings call that we dug our own grave on the Cybertruck, warning that the production has been an enormous challenge. Tesla plans to deliver only 10 Cybertrucks during its event on Thursday. I would be very surprised if the actual Cybertruck hit the road in the next year to 18 months and it had a starting price of anything lower than $60,000. I mean, that's an expensive proposition out of the gate. Amazon making some big moves this week in the world of AI. At its annual AWS reInvent conference in Vegas, the company announced a new generation of chips for training artificial intelligence. By also deepening its partnership with NVIDIA, AWS is raising the stakes in the battle for AI chip dominance. Yahoo Finance Ali Garfinkel sat down with AWS CEO Adam Salipsky to discuss the new tech and what's next for AI. We've always had a great partnership with NVIDIA. Uh, we've been working with them for 13 years. Uh, pretty much any new important chip that NVIDIA has come out with, any uh, 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 GPU, has come first through Amazon Web Services. So from the, uh, the, the original uh, ones focused on gaming and uh, 3D applications and uh, high performance computing, uh, even on through their latest uh, H100 uh, chip, which um, came out this year, we've really been the first. And so we continue to have a great relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been working very hard together on uh, some of the new things that are going to be great for our mutual customers. One is offering their DDX cloud on um, AWS. Mm -hmm. And uh, also NVIDIA is going to build essentially a very, very large supercomputer mm -hmm. using their own chips on AWS for their own internal R&D. So they're going to be making their own technology better by using AWS. What do you expect some of those capabilities to look like? We're in early days of AI. What do you sort of see as possible? Uh, I mean, I, I think that generative AI you know, over time mm -hmm. has the potential to you know, reinvent really every application that we use at work and at home. 
and we're working with you know, so many customers now, AWS customers, who are uh, think, going from thinking about generative AI to experimenting with it, and doing proofs mm -hmm. of concept, and now want to get results from it. So we're really focused on building all the capabilities at all layers of the, the generative AI mm -hmm. stack, if you will, from, from the chips to all of the model choice that people need to the applications, the non-technical people at work will interact with. And uh, I think that's what differentiates us is really no other cloud provider has delivered on capabilities at all three layers of that generative AI stack. So when people say, well, how are you different than your competitors? It's by not only thinking about, but delivering on uh, all those different capabilities. Now, sort of as you as you sort of think about the chips part of this, it's been there's been a chip shortage, an Nvidia chip shortage. You've not announced a lot of chips today, right? What ta tell me about why there was a real emphasis on it in the keynote? Sure. Well, again, it gets back to I mean, we're, we're kind of boring in how uh, you know we're. We, we don't change what's important to us. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning of AWS over 17 years ago, we focused on choice and democratization mm -hmm. and putting powerful tools in customers' hands and then letting them decide what to do with them. We're not mm -hmm. paternalistic or parental, if you will, about you know, here's, here's what, you're, what you're going to do with our technology or here's what the right technology is that you have to use. So mm -hmm. in the chip space, again, we talked about uh, the longstanding partnership we have with, um, with NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. Um, but about 10 years ago, we, we decided also, not instead of, but mm -hmm. also, uh, in addition to working with Intel and AMD and other providers, mm -hmm. that we needed to go all the way down to the silicon mm -hmm. layer, all the way down to designing our own mm -hmm. chips, if we really wanted to push the envelope mm -hmm. on price performance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we came out with, uh, we were the first cloud provider to come out with our own custom chip in, mm -hmm. uh, I think, 2018 with, with Graviton as a general purpose computing chip, uh, followed by Graviton 2, followed by Graviton 3, and today, for the for the fourth time in five years, mm -hmm. uh, we are shipping a uh, new Graviton chip, Graviton <laughs> 4. It's right here. It's not on a slide. I'm not just talking about it. It's Wave real. My hand. It is it's here. It's real. We're in preview today and shipping. And you know, other cloud providers are still just mm -hmm. you know talking about oh, we will have this, mm -hmm. we will have that. So the reason why it's important is. Um, uh, the, the compute needs that people have is just, it, it, those needs are exploding so rapidly. The amount of data and the amount of storage required um, is exploding so rapidly. But these workloads, these things that customers want to do, they aren't going to be economically feasible unless we dr keep on dramatically improving price performance. Mm -hmm. And if we can make running these workloads economical, then our customers will do magical things. Now, as you're sort of thinking about how quickly this is changing, when a technology is as moving as fast as AI, how do you gauge ROI? How do you know that the investments you're making are working? What should investors look out for, for instance, if they're trying to say, okay, this investment has worked? It's a great question because, I mean, the investments obviously are significant. I mean, since the beginning of AWS, mm -hmm. you know, we've uh, done things like, you know, build data centers and uh, invest in, uh, uh, in development teams and so forth. And the point you made today, AWS was a capital intensive big bet itself. Ex exactly. But, you know, Amazon has always been willing to, to make these big bets and in things like AWS and Prime is another good example. Mm -hmm. and, and even uh, having third party sellers, you know, sell on, AW mm -hmm. uh, on Amazon uh, was a big bet. And I, I think that um, it, what's really important is to take a long-term perspective. It is very hard to uh, have big bets with, an ex with a 90-day uh, uh, investment return window. Mm -hmm. And um, Amazon has been really good about taking a long-term view. We talk about being strategically patient and tactically impatient. And so if we won't just keep on doing the same thing if it's not working. But if we believe in something and we have a vision that in five or 10 or 20 years, it's going to be important for customers, we will stick to it. I think that really sets us apart from so many other tech companies and it's been one of the most central strengths that Amazon has had over the past couple decades. At the same time, you know, we will adjust the tactics and we will move and shift as we see what does work, what doesn't work. And, where customers want us to go. Now, big picture, how would you describe the AI landscape right now? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's really exciting, but it's mm -hmm. still, it's very early days. Mm -hmm. How and early are we talking? I think it's, it's, it's very, very early. I think we'll look back in you know, three years, five years, 10 years from now, and, and it will seem primordial you know, today. And that's not to, uh, to disrespect anything or anyone that's out there. It's incredibly exciting. There that seems that applies to even your own technology is sort of what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. We talk a lot about you know, it is still day one, and it's mm -hmm. very much still day one, I think, in generative AI. Mm -hmm. And there are great uh, capabilities out there, but it's going to continue uh, to, uh, to go so quickly and to evolve so quickly. And th that is precisely why we keep coming back to this concept of adaptability mm -hmm. being the key, you know, offering choice being the key. 
we're not going to be the only ones experimenting. Our customers want to experiment. We have customers using Model A. It's OK. They use Model B on the same workload. It's OK. They somehow figure out how to use Model A and Model B in conjunction on that same workload, and poof, they find magic. Could you leave us with your top prediction for AI in 2024? Top prediction for AI. Um, I think that uh, you will see uh, uh, models that are uh, significantly more powerful than what you see today. I think they will actually uh, improve a lot of the uh, issues that we are all uh, uh, appropriately worried about today. Uh, you're going to see a model hallucinations go down. Just for example, today our partner Anthropic um, uh, talked about uh, the model Claude 2.1, which reduces hallucinations by about 50%. And so I, I think you'll see that improving in 2024. I think you'll continue, continue to see a lot of focus on responsible AI. We will participate, as we have been, in forums, that, whether it's the White House or with the UK government, in terms of responsible AI. We're going to try and help to bring together multi-stakeholder groups to, to make sure that this incredible technology uh, is also used for good. Adam, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Adam. And of course, our thanks to Ali Garfinkel for bringing us that interview. Keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got all your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Charlie Munger, vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, a longtime right-hand man to Warren Buffett, has died. Now, he was 99 years old. And investors around the world have often turned to Buffett and Munger over the years for wisdom and advice. Now, both men are well known for their investment patience. And it's often Buffett who, who talks about passive investing, the fact that it is a winning strategy. Now, Berkshire Hathaway, over the years, along with many others, have been doing just that, often through index funds and through the use of ETFs in some cases. So joining us now for ETF Report, brought to you by Invesco QQQ, we want to bring in Todd Rosenbluth. He's Vetify's head of research. And Todd, it's great to see you here. I'm curious to get your perspective just on Berkshire Hathaway and Buffett in particular when it comes to being a proponent of passive investing and some opportunities within ETS. What do you think that's done for ETF adoption and getting more investors around the world on board? Yeah, the world's most famous active manager has been advocating for using index-based strategies, particularly the S&P 500. And we've seen it this year as well as in prior years. The iShares S&P 500 ETF IVV, the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF VOO, 
Those are two of the more popular ETFs this year. Again, topping the league leaderboard in terms of net inflows. We've seen investors embrace low cost, passive oriented ETFs for a number of years. That's where investors are putting money into. And particularly in this time of tax loss harvesting, where mutual fund companies are passing on capital gains to shareholders, ETFs are not. And that's why we think ETFs continue to gain market share, uh, specifically these low cost products like IVV and VOO. What are some of the top thematics that you're seeing play out within ETFs right now, Todd? Yeah, so you were just touching earlier, just before the break, on artificial intelligence. This has certainly been the year of artificial intelligence. We're about the one year anniversary of ChatGBT. Artificial intelligence ETFs like THNQ, that's a robo global ETF. It offers broad diversification across various themes connected to artificial intelligence. We've seen strong investor interest in that ETF as well as some of its peers in recent weeks. We think investors are gonna hold on to thematic ETFs for the longer time horizon. And of course, we are on the cusp, we think, of a spot Bitcoin ETF, not exactly a thematic oriented ETF, more of an alternative investment. But we at Vetify were talking yesterday during a Vetify alternative symposium with industry leaders from Grayscale, Bitwise, ProShares and Galaxy about the potential of what this could do for the industry in 2024. What do you think it could do for the industry in 2024? And you talk about the timeline of one, what do you think is realistic? So we expect that by the time we at Vetify are hosting the exchange conference in February, 2024, around Valentine's Day, we will have multiple spot Bitcoin ETFs that are trading. We could see Grayscale's GBTC get converted into an ETF. We could see BlackRock and Bitwise and a number of other firms offering a spot Bitcoin ETF. We think it's gonna open the door for more mainstream oriented investors to adopt a slice of their portfolio to this alternative investment. We don't think we're gonna see a huge wave of money in the first couple of days. We do think it's going to, in the first year, be a popular product. There's clamoring, there's people that are waiting for an ETF that offers spot Bitcoin exposure. And we think based on what we heard at the Vetify Alternative Symposium, there's interest in people doing more research. Why wouldn't that create then a sell the news event that could more broadly impact some of those ETFs that are hinging specifically on the approval of anything that would be annex store tracking against Bitcoin in an ETF form? So could the price of Bitcoin be impacted uh, negatively because people have been moving in to Bitcoin in general in anticipation of new buyers from a spot Bitcoin perspective? Certainly, I'm not an expert in that. But we do know that there are investors that have held out investing in cryptocurrency because they want the efficiency and the exposure through an ETF. And the ability to do that in the spot-based product uh, from leading providers tied to the crypto space uh, like Grayscale and Bitwise and from established asset managers like BlackRock and Fidelity, we think that's going to open the door for adoption of the ETF. I'll, I'll hold off to others to determine what happens to the price of Bitcoin going forward. So the other uh, thematic ETF or thematic, I guess, trend that you've seen amongst investors that are favoring ETFs right now is within the AI space. I'm curious what the excitement level is like today when you compare it to what you maybe have saw during the first half, even the first few months of the year, and whether or not that excitement's going to hold here looking ahead to 2024. So we started off the year with artificial intelligence being popular as ChatGBT first came out and people started to become aware of it and started to test it out. We've seen a resurgence in interest in artificial intelligence, uh, given the news uh, related to ChatGBT and Microsoft. I think investors are refocusing on it and heading into 2024. We are seeing interest in THNQ, that robo global ETF. We're seeing interest in other products. Uh, global X has a product, AIQ. We do think heading into 2024, thematic strategies are going to play a role and tech oriented ones uh, like the ones we just touched on uh, could gain some strong ground. Todd, all I know is somebody better be picking up that guitar <laughs> at the Vetify <laughs> holiday party and just absolutely shredding. Looks sick back there. Todd Rosenbluth, Vetify head of research. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Hey, in our next hour, we're going to be remembering the life and legacy of Charlie Munger, Berkshire Hathaway's vice chairman and investing legend. Munger influenced thousands of folks over the years with his investment philosophy, prioritizing companies for their quality rather than price alone. Plus, Wall Street reacts. We'll hear from business leaders as they pay homage to one of the titans of investing. And what does Munger's passing mean for Warren Buffett and the future of Berkshire Hathaway? Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi, and our 3 to 5 p.m. host, Julie Hyman, are going to discuss in the next hour. Special coverage starts right after the break. Welcome to Yahoo Finance. I'm Julie Hyman alongside Brian Sazi, and this is our special coverage, Charlie Munger, A Legacy. Charlie Munger, a pivotal figure behind Berkshire Hathaway and the right-hand man to Warren Buffett, died yesterday at the age of 99. He would have turned 100 on New Year's Day. Credited by the Oracle of Omaha and helping broaden the firm's investment strategy, he was known for an ability to turn a phrase and big profits. Munger was born in Omaha in 1924 after a stint in the Army and graduating Harvard Law School in 1948. He began his career as a lawyer and settled in California. In 1959, Munger met a 29-year-old Warren Buffett at a dinner party in Omaha. The rest, well, that is financial history. More interested in outpacing the S&P 500 than outdoing each other, the other half of a famous duo told CNBC back in 2018 that they never once had an argument. He believed in keeping it simple. This is the man himself back in 2019. Single example in my whole life where keeping it simple has worked against us. We've made mistakes, but they weren't because we kept it simple.
I would say that the chief advantage that Berkshire has had in accumulating a good record is that we have avoided the pompous bureaucratic systems. We've tried to give power to very talented people and let them make very quick decisions. So that is uh, really, you know, Julie, we, um, we toss the word legend around a lot in, in the world of finance, sports, life in general, but mm -hmm. this was a true invest in lesson, uh, investing legend uh, in, in Charlie Munger and not only helped build Berkshire and serve as that, I think, that check on some things that Warren Buffett may or may not want to do, but really, I think, brought investing a new way of investing, not only to the United States, but to the world. Yeah, and there's some talk about value investing and what he brought to the table versus a Warren Buffett, that Buffett wanted to buy uh, companies at low prices, not as focused on the quality of the companies, and it was Munger who brought that sort of looking for a better quality company, also at a reasonable price, not necessarily as bargain basement as uh, Buffett was focused on. You know, Munger was very active you know, even just as... He was just doing very, interviews a couple doing weeks interviews. ago. I was just listening to a podcast he gave with two young investors. They had dinner with him. They recorded it for the podcast. They were asking him for advice. He was doling it out as he was wont to do. Um, and he talked about how much more challenging it has gotten to win at investing in this market, harder to find good values in the market. Um, you know, and it was it was quite interesting. He talked about almost everything being overvalued right now. So even up until the end, giving that advice, and by the way, on that podcast, he also talked about the party he was planning for, for his 100th birthday. That He said the place where they were planning was packed to the gills. So maybe now they'll have a celebration of his life yeah, and, uh, on January 1st. Absolutely, and really, one thing I want to get to uh, with our guests today, I'm really excited to talk to all of them, is can his style of investing be replicated today with some mm. form of success? Consider when Charlie Munger was born, what, 1924? Great Depression periods, no technology, there was no program trading. It was just like, what, tickers coming out of a machine. I mean, can you still find that success? Could you rebuild Berkshire if you had to today? He, he seems to indicate it would be very, very challenging. All right, let's get into the life and times of a pivotal figure of the financial community. Joining us now, Gregory Zuckerman, special writer at the Wall Street Journal, and Lawrence Cunningham, research professor at George Washington University and author of the essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America. I'll start with you. Uh, what have been, yes. what were some of your fondest memories of, of Charlie Munger? And just like what we were talking about, can what he created at Berkshire, can that be replicated? Well, thanks for having me. Uh, Charlie is a legend. You use that word, I think, properly in, in this case. And I, I knew him, had the fortune of knowing him for about 30 years. And, um, you know, he called it like he saw it. He was not sugar-coated. Uh, people say he was cynical or curmudgeonly. That's probably all fair. But he was lucid, smart. Uh, incisive, thoughtful, uh, and, and very good at coaching Warren, which was not an easy thing to do. But as you suggested, he helped guide Warren away from the scuttlebutt approach, uh, the cigar butt approach to investing towards the quality investing approach. And Warren said that made all the difference at Berkshire starting in 1972. Could it be done again? It, it, it couldn't be done in exactly the same way, but some of the principles, the principles of trust, rationality, learnedness, focus, um, can still be important to uh, a successful business. And they're, they're still important at Berkshire as it continues to grow. Um, Greg, there are a lot of brilliant investors out there. What is it that made Charlie Munger so unique, so special in his, in his investment approach? Well, what I found really interesting is that a lot of the biggest mistakes that I've noticed over the years among really super smart and successful investors is the need to keep being active and to manage more money and to allocate and find the next great trade. Whereas Charlie emphasized that when I met with him and, and he's talked to other people, the need for patience. And there are times when you don't want to do anything. You sit on your hands and it's really hard for hedge funds and other kinds of big investors to do that, and that's an advantage Charlie had and, and Warren as well. Uh, if someone is watching this right now and they're trying to figure out, can I invest like a Charlie Munger? Can I do what he did? What are some of his characteristics? And can they be replicated? Can I jump into his shoes and find success? Well, I'd, I'd say the number one lesson is to find a good partner. I, both Charlie and Warren credit each other for their own success. And they would have been successful without each other, but the stratospheric successes they achieved was because they had a reliable, trustworthy, intelligent partner. So that would be tip number one, whether it's your spouse, your business partner, or some could be your parents, but uh, find someone to bounce things off of. 
Uh, Charlie saved Berkshire many billions of dollars by telling Warren, no, don't, don't do that. that. That'd be a mistake. And so having someone to check your logic, check your, check your rationality would be extremely important. Are there other investing legends alive right now outside of Warren Buffett? Do you see a next generation forming or who, who, do, who does that torch get passed to from Buffett and Munger? Well, they've got a great brain trust right there at Berkshire Hathaway with Todd Coombs and Ted Weschler, who manage the, the common stock portfolio, and, and Greg Abel and Ajit Jain, who are the vice chairs who, who allocate abundant capital. And so that, that generation is formidable at, at Berkshire. And indeed, at least in terms of the, the philosophy that, that Charlie is famous for, uh, tens of thousands of people have, uh, have learned it, have, have embraced it, and uh, I think they'll, they'll continue to flourish by applying those principles. Um, and Greg, when you um, talk to um, Charlie and to Warren and to other people in in the Berkshire universe, for that matter, what kind of perspective did you get on what sort of shaped them historically, for that matter, as well? You know, when you hear Munger say things like there aren't as many opportunities now as there were when he started out, you know, what's sort of the historical context? Well, things have changed, and he acknowledged that uh, to me. I mean, frankly, their returns over the last decade or so are not nearly what they were in the past. So markets are much more efficient. Um, and also their approach, which um, has worked, doesn't work for everyone. They've had a lot of good fortune as well. And Charlie, frankly, has done really great things away from Warren and away from uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which you got to give him a lot of credit for, too. Things like Costco and BYD. Yeah, Berkshire got involved a little bit and got out. But I find it just as fascinating that Charlie made these big bets on his own. He had conviction away from Berkshire Hathaway and away from Warren Buffett. you got to give him a lot of credit for that. I mean, Costco was a lifelong love affair he had, um, or decades-long love affair he had with Costco to the end. He's a director, and he was a big believer to the end. He spoke all about the beauty of retail, and Warren wasn't a uh, believer necessarily in retail. So while we have to acknowledge their um, partnership and how they helped each other, and they really did, you also got to um, give Charlie some credit for some of his own investing. Lawrence, as someone has written extensively uh, about this pair, what do you think the days and weeks ahead look like for Warren Buffett. Are we, do we see him on stage at that Berkshire meeting in 2024? Well, Warren is undoubtedly- Meaning, meaning does he pass the baton finally, formally, from the CEO perspective? I, I, it's a great question. It'll be entirely up to him. My prediction is that Warren will continue to run Berkshire Hathaway until his uh, final moment. Um, as far as recognition of Charlie, I, I, you know, I, they should probably have an empty chair uh, on the stage at the, at the Berkshire Annual Meeting in May. Uh, I think the transition has been uh, underway for some time uh, to those fellows I, I mentioned and, and to the next uh, level of board of directors. And so I think they'll continue with that. I'd, so I think Warren is you know, bereft and, and, and despondent uh, this season, but he'll, he'll, uh, he'll carry forward as he always has done. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and also, Greg, uh, will we see maybe more visibility from the other folks who are running Berkshire right now? It's a great question. Uh, we in the media have wanted that for, for a while. We'd love to have some access uh, and uh, dialogue. Um, Warren is still the man, though, and you got to give him so much credit for things like Apple. Yes, um, others in the organization first um, place to trade, but he's the one who expanded it. So I kind of agree that as uh, for the foreseeable future, Warren will continue doing what he's doing. And frankly, he hasn't relied on Charlie as much in recent years, as much as he appreciates the, the friendship and the guidance. And he was so important earlier on. So I don't think this will have as much of an impact uh, on Berkshire Hathaway in the near term. All right. Thanks to you both so much. Gregory Zuckerman, special writer at The Wall Street Journal, and Larry Cunningham, a research professor at George Washington University and author of The Essays of Warren Buffett, Lessons for Corporate America. Well, coming up, we're taking a closer look at Charlie Munger's impact on Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett himself. That's next. I'm always being visited by young men who say, I, I'm practicing law and I don't like it. I'd rather be a billionaire. How can I do it? And I tell them, well, I'll tell you a story. A young man goes to see Mozart, and he says, Mozart, I want to start composing symphonies. And Mozart said, how old are you? And the guy says, 22. And he says, you're too young to do symphonies. And the guy says, yes, but you were 10 years old when you were composing symphonies. And Mozart says, 
Yes, but I wasn't running around asking other people how to do it. So I think this flitting around business is something not everybody should try. Yeah, I think and I think if I tried it again, it might not have worked as well. Charlie Munger died at 99 years old on Tuesday, leaving an incredible mark on the field of investing and business. The Berkshire Hathaway vice chairman was considered to be Warren Buffett's right-hand man. In a statement, Buffett said, quote, Berkshire Hathaway could not have been built to its present status without Charlie's inspiration, wisdom, and participation. For more on Charlie Munger's legacy and his lasting impact on Berkshire Hathaway, we're joined by Steve Check, Check Capital Management President and CIO, and David Cass finance professor at University of Maryland. So, uh, David, let's start with you. Talk to us about Munger's relationship with Buffett and what lies ahead now for Berkshire now that he is gone. Um, you know, but first talk to us about the partnership and, and what impact Munger had on the investing decisions that the firm made. Yes, M uh, Munger uh, made a very positive decision uh, or impression, I should say, on Warren Buffett in the sense that he stressed the importance of investing in growth companies and focusing on the income statement looking forward, not just looking at maybe undervalued bargains on a balance sheet. So that was one of his major contributions. And he also served as a sort of alter ego uh, as Buffett referred to him as the abominable no man, uh, someone who would check uh, maybe some of Buffett's impulses that perhaps uh, Charlie disagreed with some potential investments in certain areas and brought that uh, certainly to Warren's attention. So I think they worked extremely well uh, for all these decades Again, they never had a really major disagreement, although they may uh, differ on their viewpoints, but he, he brought that uh, sort of a second opinion, uh, so to speak, uh, to Buffett. Mm -hmm. And the two of them just uh, were certainly thinking on the same wavelength and together made just uh, a, a team that I don't think could easily be reproduced. Uh, I've said before, uh, there's only one Warren Buffett, and of course, there's only one Charlie Munger. And certainly as a team, there was only that one Buffett-Munger team. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, certainly going forward, 
uh, Munger's uh, input to the investment process at Berkshire uh, will continue in terms of his uh, principles. Steve, so then my question to you is, as um, you just mentioned, um, Munger has played that right-hand man to Buffett, uh, sounding board, acquisitions, buying stocks. You know, for as long as Buffett now stays atop Berkshire, do you think he will be reluctant to pull the trigger on that long-awaited big deal? Uh, no, I mean, first of all, they, I think they thought of each other as the two smartest guys, well, the smartest guy that each of them had each other met. Um, but, uh, and, and certainly Warren Buffett is the only one that really swayed Warren Buffett over the history is, is Charlie Munger. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as making the big decisions at Berkshire, that, that still is Warren Buffett. Um, and, and that will continue, of course, as long as Warren Buffett is, is running Berkshire. But boy, he's going to really miss Charlie. I really got the feeling that both men um, really just kind of worked as hard as they did to almost impress each other more than anybody else. They just they just loved each other, best friends, and the relationship goes back, you know, over 60 years. Um, and and as, you know, someone who watches Berkshire, Steve, um, you know, did, did you see sort of any mistakes that the duo made, or are there notable um, things that you saw them sort of learn from as, thing, as, as time went on? Well, I think you know Charlie was was more about life lessons than he even was about investing. As great of an investor as he was, but he he was so well rounded and so well read. And yeah, one of the things he used to like to talk about was you know we like to review our mistakes and rub our noses in them and uh, and really learn from them. You know, if you're going to make a mistake, you know, you know try to take the positive from it. So they they made mistakes. Um, they've acknowledged those mistakes and uh, and they, they acknowledge that they'll make more mistakes. And a lot of times the annual reports that Warren Buffett would write would start with, you know, the mistakes. He says they were always about uh, give us the bad news. The good news will take care of itself. So they weren't afraid. They were very confident men. They were obviously the best there was at, at this and the best duo that we've ever witnessed. Um, but they and they weren't afraid to admit to making mistakes and saying everyone does that. David, is there any reason to own Berkshire Hathaway shares? I think uh, and there's every reason in the world. I don't see Berkshire uh, doing any worse, let's say, in the years ahead. Certainly, uh, Berkshire has substantially outperformed the market over its 55-year uh, history under Warren Buffett. In recent years, it's been tracking the S&P 500. But uh, going forward, uh, in, in Buffett's recent words, uh, it's been built to last. I think it is well diversified, uh, growth opportunities. And then uh, with Greg Abel coming in at some point <clears throat> when Warren is no longer there, I think the, the uh, succession plan is in place and the outlook is just as bright as it has ever been. Steve, let me uh, last word to you here, and just playing on what I just uh, asked David, is it better to own Berkshire Hathaway shares, knowing that Warren Buffett, for whatever reason, may not be around or top leading the company for much longer, or do you go into his portfolio and start picking out names that might represent great value, like a Coca-Cola, like an American Express, that arguably don't have that same risk uh, concentrated as if you were to own Berkshire Hathaway? No, as David said, um, you know Berkshire was built to last, and uh, Berkshire put together the way it's been put together is 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 a much better company than than the individual pieces. And so, there's a there's a lot of you know tax advantages in the way it's been put together. Um, it's it's a very diversified, and uh, and even though as as David pointed out, maybe it's more or less matched the S and P 500's returns over the last 10 or 15 years. I feel it's done it with a lot less risk, personally. Than the S and P 500 is traded at a low valuation. Uh, Berkshire has, and uh, I think it has you know better upside from here than let's say the, and a diversified S and P 500. So Berkshire itself is extremely diversified, owning something like 80 or 90 subsidiaries, having the huge investment portfolio that we all know about. Um, I consider it a very very low risk uh, single holding. All right, really appreciate the uh, the insight, Steve Check, Check Capital Management President and CIO, and. David Cass, finance professor at the University of Maryland. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. You bet. Coming up, titans of business in Wall Street. Remember Charlie Munger. I don't consider myself a... I think my way of thinking will work for anybody, of trying to be very rational and disciplined. So I think that much. 
but to flit around to various careers and go into the other fellow's professional territory and try and outdo him and do all kinds of things like that, I think will not work for most people. And so I always tell, I'm always being visited by young men who say, I, I'm practicing law and I don't like it. I'd rather be a billionaire. How can I do it? And I tell them, well, I'll tell you a story. A young man goes to see Mozart. And he says, Mozart, I want to start composing symphonies. And Mozart said, how old are you? And the guy says, 22. And he says, you're too young to do symphonies. And the guy says, yes, but you were 10 years old when you were composing symphonies. And Mozart says, yes, but I wasn't running around asking other people how to do it. So I think this flitting around business is something not everybody should try. Yeah, I think and I think if I tried it again, it might not have worked as well. The business world is taking in the passing of Berkshire Hathaway's Charlie Munger, and it's safe to say that over his life he experienced many things that influenced his investing style. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery to dig into this for us. Jared. Charlie Munger, he was born on New Year's Day in 1924 in the midst of the Roaring Twenties at a time of rapid growth in the United States, but also a decade of rampant speculation. Excesses of the 20s, when the Dow quintupled in value, would give way to the Great Depression and a lost decade of austerity. Now, Munger was the son of a lawyer. He did not grow up poor, but his youth was no doubt shaped by the tough times. Later in life, he would famously say, the big money is not in the buying and the selling, but in the waiting. From the ashes of the speculative excess of the 1920s came the rise of value investing. That's where patience is a virtue. Investors looking for value study companies' financial statements, searching for stocks that are trading cheaper than their fundamentals say they ought to be. Putting a fine point on this, Munger also said, if you don't get the deferred gratification concept, you fail at investing. Munger had disdain for speculators looking to turn a quick buck, and history is replete with examples of instant millionaires or billionaires gone broke. Munger would live through one of the most extreme examples of this, the GameStop and Reddit episode of 2021, where value investors, ironically, they found themselves sitting on quick grains in traditionally quiet stocks like AMC Entertainment and GameStop itself.
Now, one Munger once said, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And over the pandemic, we learned a lot about incentives that bored novice inventors, excuse me, investors playing with stimulus money they didn't care about losing, they could actually tip the scales in favor of retail traders for a short time. We know that wouldn't last, but at least when Munger's patience, that came into play. What about the blistering pace of technological innovation? Buffett and Munger, they were both not big in the tech stocks, though Apple would become their biggest position. Munger put it best when he said, we have three baskets for investing. Yes, no, and too tough to understand. Arguably, that last bucket fits a lot of the innovation we've seen since the internet boom of the 1990s. And the rise of artificial intelligence role, its role in tech and public, its fascination is only underscoring this point. But Munger also famously said, the great lesson in microeconomics is to discriminate between when technology is going to help you and when it's going to kill you. <laughs> Most people do not get this straight in their heads. Find an example of Munger's acerbic wit. And indeed, the fear factor is already showing its hand as many tech leaders, even, even Elon Musk, they worry about the existential impact of AI. That's going to take years, if not decades, to play out. But through it all, it might be helpful to remember one last quote, quote from the Oracle of Omaha's sidekick, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. That means sticking it out through thick and thin if you're a long-term passive investor and something that's something that both Munger and Warren Buffett thought investors should aspire to be. RIP Charlie Munger. Jared, thank you. Thanks for that tour through his quotes, through history. Very interesting perspective. Well, as the financial world says goodbye to one source of age-old wisdom in Berkshire Hathaway's Charlie Munger, names and business are responding in kind, remembering the legendary investor from their business interactions, but also to some on a more personal level, paying tribute to a man who left a mark on investing and on business. So we have gotten a number of different reactions. I know you've spoken to a number of different folks uh, with with what they've had to say. Yeah, I should note that full text piece now on the Yahoo Finance homepage. I have a really nice section uh, capturing everything we've been putting out uh, now on the homepage. But who I caught up with uh, last night was, uh, among many, Costco CEO Craig Jelinek. Um, he was actually in Long Island, I'm sure, getting ready to visit some stores. And he was reflecting on Munger, who was a board member for Costco for close to 27 years, mm -hmm. telling me that it was just a tremendous, quote, a tremendous, uh, Munger was a tremendous asset to have at Costco. And he viewed uh, Munger as a legend, uh, often uh, went to Munger to help um, understand complex problems, uh, law-related issues. But again, uh, to have Munger on that Costco board, uh, really a, a big win. And I, I asked Jelinek, why do you think Munger loved Costco? I mean, this is a long time to be on any board. That's not the norm. He said, we, we admit when we're wrong and we try to correct our mistakes. And I think, I, I thought, wow, you know what? After I got off the phone, that's Charlie Munger, that he appreciates that honesty. And Munger talked about, he got involved in Costco before it was Costco. Yes. When it was still Price Club. Price Club, yes. So, and um, in, that, in that interview that I was talking about earlier, he talked about how um, he was asked, you know, one of Costco's things that it has done, interestingly, is offer value, but to a higher income consumer. Mm -hmm. And he was asked, you know, was that deliberate? And he said yes, and they realized it even all the way back in the Price Club days. Which and I also, was I think just very reflective of a typical Munger or Berkshire Hathaway type of play or an investment, betting on people, betting on people that you can trust. And the founder of Price Club, that was Saul Price. He established warehouse retailing in America at the same time uh, Sam Walton was rolling out discount mm -hmm. stores across the country. Now, Berkshire at one point also owned shares of Walmart. Um, but again, uh, Berkshire getting access really to like game changing people mm -hmm. really early on in their careers. Fascinating. Yeah. And then you talked to some of the other folks who yeah. um, Berkshire invested in, the likes of a, what American Express, I think, as well, and some of the others. Yeah. Stephen Squarey uh, saying uh, that they helped uh, Warren Buffett and, and Berkshire Hathaway. They built an iconic company together. Uh, he's calling Charlie a legendary investor. Coca-Cola CEO uh, James Quincy, of course, Coca-Cola, one of the longtime most legendary investments for Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, Quincy telling Yahoo Finance, quote, Charlie was exceptional. He was a savvy business mind whose innovative insights left an indelible mark and genuinely made our world better. Going on even further on this piece, uh, we had a Brooks running CEO, Jim Weber, who I believe is going to be on with us yes. in the 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, hour. He said, quote, what a milestone for Berkshire to lose Charlie at 99. For me, he was wisdom personified. Um, I reached out to uh, Bill Ackman as well because I think of Bill, you know, as one of the other 
younger generation of well-known investors, not, uh, you know, maybe of the same, not a household name in the same way. Um, and he said this, as a professor of life and living, Charlie confronted us with the most powerful direct truths about, and educated us about character, psychology, morality, judgment, judgment, wisdom, investing, and more. He was an unabashed, unafraid exemplar of a man. I mean, you know, just lionized in the financial community. And I think that honesty that sort of Bill alluded to was also a big part of his appeal. Like he was a no BS kind of guy. And and off of that, you know, Bill Ackman has extensively studied these two. And mm -hmm. I think what Lawrence was telling us in the prior segment, you know, these two gentlemen have created tens and thousands of people that think and operate and invest like they do. So are we looking at a future where there are more investing legends? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But as as again, as Munger said, it's tougher to do it now than it used to be. Very true. All right, Warren Buffett and the late Charlie Munger are synonymous, not just with value investing, but more broadly have been have long been figureheads for the financial industry. Now at the passing of Munger, the business world and its leaders are reacting to the loss of a legend. Let's bring in NPR business desk correspondent David Gura to discuss more. David, good to see you here. Thanks for taking some time. Really, uh, really an outpouring of uh, interest, of course, in all things Charlie Munger and what he represented to the financial community. Uh, what was your experience with, with Munger, and what do you think his legacy will be? Like so, Betty, I mean, I was someone who listened to his words, pithy as they were. He had a real economy of speech, and I think that was so appealing to investors, to journalists, to his colleagues. Uh, there was something deeply rooted about the wisdom that he was espousing. I was struck by something you quoted there from the Coca-Cola CEO just a moment ago, saying that he, he was innovative. A lot of the stuff... It wasn't that innovative. It was, again, deeply rooted and so core to how uh, I think a lot of people think that they would approach their lives. And he was able to sort of make that manifest in the world of, of business as well. And so much of what you've been talking about, I think, is what's so appealing to people in business. He was no nonsense. Uh, he was pithy. Uh, he wasn't shy about expressing his own opinion. And uh, there, there, there was something about that marriage between the way that he lived his life and the way that he approached business that I think makes him stand out, makes him appealing, makes him somebody that I think other business leaders would want, want to emulate and probably would do well to, to emulate if they could follow in his footsteps in, in that way, um, to, to not make things overly thick and confusing with jargon, but to be clear and clear-sighted about uh, what his objectives are and what he thought would be successful and what would work. You know, it's interesting to me because in talking about Charlie Munger, um, not as much of a household name as Warren Buffett, which I think is kind of interesting, right? That, like, in, in talking to people, just people outside of our little business world <laughs> about Charlie Munger, um, not everybody necessarily knew who he was. So it's interesting that he is such um, a towering figure within business and thought of alongside Warren Buffett, and yet he did not necessarily seek out a very high profile. Now, Julie, everyone with whom I spoke said that he was not somebody who <laughs> uh, enjoyed the spotlight or liked to be in it. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from the way that the two of them saw each other, Warren Buffett and, and Charlie Munger. And that was, of course, no better exemplified than when they were on stage together at the annual shareholders meeting. I mean, people came to see both of them. And, um, you know, they were, of course, eager to hear what Warren Buffett had to say about any number of things. <laughs> but I think everyone was queued up waiting for what the kind of short, uh, concise response was going to be, what, what Charlie Munger was going to add on, on the heels of that. And so many people with whom I spoke as I prepared my obituary for NPR said, uh, you know, they were really sounding boards for, for one another. And even in this very advanced age, they spoke daily. You know, the, the first phone call that Warren Buffett often made was to Charlie Munger in, in California. So this relationship really continued. And uh, so I'm sure Lawrence Cunningham emphasized, as he emphasized to me, uh, that power that Charlie Munger had to say no or to encourage Warren Buffett to reevaluate something that he thought might be smart or wise uh, was really powerful. And so, yes, I think that when you look at them from kind of a, a public vantage, no, he didn't have the kind of public profile or personality that Warren Buffett did, but the two of them saw each other as a real partnership, really relied on one another. And I think that at this moment, kind of looking at the role he played, it's really critical to see that, um, yeah, he might not have had the public presence, but he was arguably just as powerful uh, in terms of what he was doing behind the scenes and what he was doing in that business relationship with, with Warren. Dave, we're all journalists here, and part of our role is to hold truth to power. Now, one of the most powerful people at Berkshire is pretty soon Greg Abel, uh, and not a lot of investors or the public know anything about him. How important is it that Berkshire starts to put him out there, that we get to know him more, and in addition to him, Todd Combs and, and the other folks uh, managing that investment portfolio? 
I think it's critical, and I think we'll see that happen largely in the way that Berkshire has operated for at least many decades. And that is, I think that that shareholder meeting will be important. I think you look, you, of course, so much is made of the fact the website hasn't been updated. News is conveyed from this company much the same way it was 10, 15, 20, 20 years ago. I think that's likely to continue. But, you know, I did notice, as I'm sure you did over these recent years, more of an emphasis on what succession was going to look like, what this level of continuity was going to be like. Um, this is, I think, I think Charlie Munger saw it this way. I think that Warren Buffett sees it this way as, as a family, yes, a very, very large family. People have gotten incredibly rich as a result of investing in, in this company. Uh, but I think the approach is largely going to be in line with that. Um, there have been opportunities at recent shareholder meetings to meet some of the successors that you mentioned. I think obviously they're going to take more prominent roles uh, as all of this, as this carries on. Uh, but I don't expect it to be done in any sort of flashy way. You say you're going to get out there more. I don't expect, you know, a bevy of interviews or, or a different way of looking at the profile of those who are running this company. Uh, but I do think there is this recognition that continuity is key here, continuity about the mission and the ethos of this company. And that's going to be conveyed, I think, in much the same way that it's been conveyed uh, over the last 40, 50 years. Well said. NPR Business De Desk correspondent David Gura. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Thank much you. more on the investment legacy of Charlie Munger next. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Well, I think Warren and I have come to tech like some newborn infant that's dragged there. We've had to come because, because reality has dragged us there. Apple is one of the strongest companies in the world. I judge the strength of the company based on how much the customers love it. And I've got zillions of friends who they'd almost part with their right arm before they'd part with their iPhone. That's a hugely powerful position to be in. And I think Apple is one of the strong companies and will stay a strong company. And I think it's ungodly well managed. Charlie Munger leaves behind a great legacy and a revered investment thesis, but he never shied away from his lack of interest in one asset, crypto. If you stop to think about it, it's an ideal currency if you want to commit extortion or kidnapping or have a protection racket, racket or something. Of course I hate it. I, I, don't think it's a, I don't think it's good that our country is going crazy over Bitcoin and its ilk. 
I think the communist Chinese were wiser than we were. They just banned it. I think it was a huge Charlie, mistake to, to allow it at all. For more on Munger's investment timeline, we're joined by Yahoo Finance's Inez Frey. Hi, Inez. Hi, Julie. And as you just heard there, it's fair to say when Munger spoke about crypto, he made headlines with his zinger lines bashing on the virtual currency. In fact, he didn't believe it was a currency at all. In February, Munger wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal titled, Why America Should Ban Crypto, writing a cryptocurrency is not a currency, not a commodity, and not a security. Instead, it's a gambling contract with a nearly 100 100% edge for the house. He often referred to crypto as crap and also used another word, which means the same thing and considered a swear word. <laughs> and at the Daily Journal annual meeting, he said, I think the people that oppose my position are idiots. And so I don't think there is a rational argument against my position. Now, it is worth noting that Munger made no distinction between crypto and Bitcoin, virtual currencies. He did not like any of them and use them interchangeably. And at Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting last year, he said, when you have your own retirement account and your friendly advisor suggests you put all your money into Bitcoin, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> Wise advice, Inez. Were there some investments that he was really keen on over the years? Yeah, Munger was a big believer in the Chinese economy, often speaking highly of the Chinese government and their economy. It's worth noting Berkshire Hathaway is an investor in Apple, and as we just heard earlier, has also a big presence in the Chinese market, and Munger spoke uh, very well of Apple. He also was a key decision maker in, in the investment in BYD in 2008. That's a Chinese EV maker, competitor to Tesla. And the investment at the time was $230 million. Those shares are now worth about $2.4 billion. In February, Munger said, I have never helped do anything at Berkshire Hathaway that was as good as BYD, and I only did it once. BYD is so much ahead of Tesla in China. And fun fact, BYD is short for build your dreams. And it's fair to say that Munger built many dreams throughout his life. All right. Well said. Thanks so much, Inez. Appreciate it. Thank you. The legacy that Charlie Munger left will live on, along with his investment style. Munger's approach was that good, opportunities were few and far between, and that has left a mark on the Berkshire Hathaway ethos when it comes to value investing. For more on this, Jonathan Boyer, president of Boyer Value, and Steve Sosnick, chief strategist of Interactive Brokers, are both here with us. Good morning to you both. Uh, Jonathan, let me start with you. A lot of focus on how Munger and Buffett invest, looking for attractive valuations on stocks. Can their approach be replicated right now? Uh can their approach be replicated? Yeah, it, it, it can be. But what differentiated, and it is a great quote, uh, Buffett uh, once said that uh, if he had just listened to Ben Graham and not Charlie, he'd be a lot poorer. And Charlie was an important teacher to Warren in the fact that he told him to invest in high quality companies at fair prices instead of doing the cigar butt type of investing that he was doing before. So that was a huge influence on Buffett's and Berkshire's uh, investment success. Jonathan, uh, has, did Charlie Munger change your life? Is that why you got into this business? I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why I got into business, but Berkshire Hathaway was an inspiration. I mean, he, they, what they built was fantastic and it's never gonna be replicated again. And he was kind enough to write and publicly speak about all of his wisdom and share it with people. And that's something that I'm grateful for. And he inspired a, a whole generation of, of investors. At the same time, I got to say, Steve, bringing, bringing you into this, there are a lot of value investors out there, but it's not what's sort of trendy right now for sure, right? Like growth stocks have been outperforming uh, pretty consistently. So how do you, you know, how should we think about that then, the legacy of value investing when growth is so dominant? Well, here's the key, Julie. Um, you know, one of their biggest investments is Apple, which is a growth right. stock, but it's actually, I think, actually morphing to a value stock in front of our eyes, but it's still priced like a growth stock. So you've got both, you've got both aspects of it. Um, you know, BYD was a value stock that it was a growth stock that he bought at value prices. You know, I think so that's really, to me, in, in many ways, the key is finding finding the opportunities where these are, where there are values, price, growth stocks being priced like value stocks. And Munger, Munger specifically, 
uh, was was terrific at that uh, alongside Warren Buffett. Remember also, you know, I, I always appreciate the Mr. Inside guy, you know, somebody who spent most of his career as sort of Mr. Inside. I like that he was Mr. Inside to Warren Buffett's outside um, and, and sort of the guy who could propose things to him without uh, fear of conflict or the guy who could say no to him, which there were probably many people who could say no to Warren Buffett. Jonathan, let me go, uh, go back to you. Charlie Munger, of course, um, not here, um, passed away, um, but Warren Buffett, once he leaves for whatever reason, is, is there another group of investing legends that you look to? The reality is these two folks have trained generations of human beings on how to invest. Who, is, who takes that mantle now? No one. Uh, they are in a class by themselves. Uh, they're, they not only were great investors in buying pieces of paper, they bought entire companies and businesses and, and put them together. And their legacy is going to be this company that's built to last for, for generations. But there's no one investor who's going to take the Charlie Munger or uh, a Warren Buffett yeah, have had that level of influence. It's it's uh, you know we we lost a legend. Well, and and it's difficult to imagine replicating buying whole companies, for example, because the size of companies, the economy has changed, uh, particularly in the U.S. But Steve, you know, both Buffett and Munger have talked about it's really hard to find those good values right now, right? Munger uh, has talked about things being very overpriced, so. What what are investors to do then, even if they did want to replicate that kind of activity? Well, you know, there's a couple of ways to unpack the question. First of all is valuations are high. Um, and so when valuations in general are high, there aren't a lot of values by definition. Um, whether or not value stocks are out of favor or not, even they're uh, historically on the high side in terms of pricing. Secondly, um, they created a lot of I'm not going to say imitators, but they inspired a lot of people to to play a similar game. We have, you know, trillions of dollars allocated to pri to private equity or, or strategies that are, that use sort of similar buy the buy the company mentality. Um, and so there's a lot more competition for them than there was when they started. You know, think about even now some of their bigger yeah you know, some of their bigger names some of their more recent large investments. These are big companies because they're investing such huge amounts of money that they, they can't necessarily buy, you know, find these small undervalued companies. They need to find big companies that the market has overlooked, find something different about them. That's really not easy to do, especially when you're talking about such huge numbers um, as the size of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. Uh, Steve, la last word to you. Um the current debate in, uh, in the market seems to be when the Fed is going to cut interest rates. Now, if you talk to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, both of them would probably say, we don't give a crap. We're holding these companies darn near forever. An investor watching Yahoo Finance right now, should they take that approach? Forget what is happening in the markets from day to day. Buy shares of a, a Coca-Cola, American Express, if they have wide moats around their business and hold it for 50 years. If your time frame is is that long, sure. I mean, you know, again, the 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 good and the bad thing is we're talking about a you know a man who died at 99 years old. God bless him. He was doing what he loved for for decades, and and unfortunately, Warren Buffett is is not that much younger. Father time remains undefeated, sadly. But you know, if you're a very long term investor, if you're a young investor with a long time horizon, you should just be thinking about what companies might be around for, for 50 years. And, and even so, and it's not the hot companies all the time, because if you look at what the market loved 50 years ago, many of these companies are not in business. These guys found the companies that would have the lasting track record. So if you could find them, you hold on to them for dear life. Um, and it doesn't matter if the Fed's going to cut rates in May or June or July. It matters whether these companies have the staying power and the earning power and the business acumen to be the investments for you for the long term. If you're if you're of advanced age watching this, well, you have to be a bit more short term oriented. Yeah. Thanks to you both so much. It's great to see both of you. Jonathan Boyer, president of Boyer Value and Steve Sosnick, interactive brokers, chief strategist. Thank you. Thank you. 
Simply put, Berkshire Hathaway would not be the same without Charlie Munger. It's a tall ask for someone to follow in the footsteps of someone so instrumental to Berkshire's success. But Munger himself noted in 2021 he believed Vice Chair Greg Abel would keep the culture at the investment conglomerate. And in a letter last week, Buffett acknowledged that at 93, his own time may soon come to a close. But assured shareholders, Berkshire was built to last with more on the future now. Let's talk about Thomas, let's talk about more on the future. Thomas Hayes is joining us, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member, alongside Gregory Warren, Morningstar Senior Stock Analyst. Tom, let's start with you. Um, are you confident in this, you know, upcoming generation of Berkshire? As we've been talking about throughout the hour, we don't know nearly as much, or at least have not heard nearly as much at, from the likes of a Greg Abel as we have from Buffett and Munger. Well, there's no question. Uh, there's going to be f full confidence in the future of Berkshire Hathaway. The businesses run themselves. You know, people are going to continue to get their ice cream at Dairy Queen. They're going to continue to use their iPhones. They're going to continue to save money on their insurance at Geico. You know, the, the, the home office right now, the whole concept of a de decentralized business, they have 26 employees at the home office and tens of thousands of employees throughout the operating subsidiaries. But I did want to say one quick thing about Warren Buffett. You know, a lot of people look at uh, about Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. They look at Charlie Munger as Warren's right-hand man. But I think people forget that Charlie was his own man, sometimes referenced as the Oracle of Pasadena. Mm -hmm. And I want to give you one key example that he did in 2001, which really inspired me and uh, hasn't been talked about a lot in the last 24 hours. He bought a little company himself uh, stock in a company called Tenneco. And Tenneco was actually kind of a Ben Graham net net. He always talks about buying uh, wonderful businesses at a fair price. This was a fair business at a wonderful price. The stock had fallen 80% from 2000 to 2001. He read about this company in Barron's. He said, I've been reading Barron's for 50 years and uh, I got one investment idea. Here's what he did. The stock was at $1.50, $1.50 to $2 down from $10. He bought $10 million worth. Within three, four years, the stock was up to 15. He made about $80 million between the stock and the debt that he bought. He took that $80 million and he gave it to Li Lu in the early 2000s when China was out of favor. And Li Lu turned the 80 million into a half a billion. So two chess moves, the Oracle of Pasadena turned $10 million of his own money into half a billion dollars. And I think people always forget that. And, you know, uh, Munger always said, I didn't intend to get rich. I just wanted to become independent. I guess I overshot. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, uh, I wish I could uh, replicate that track record. Greg, let me get over to you. And, and you know, we're watching Berkshire Hathaway shares all, all day. And, Follow me here. Do you think Berkshire shares are overvalued, that investors are underpricing the risk when Warren Buffett uh, is no longer leading this company? There seems to be a lot of belief that the culture will live on, uh, but that is a wildly untested thesis. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to look at from that perspective. I mean, relative to our fair value estimate right now, the stock is about you know, 10 12% undervalued. Um, but I think it, over the past, I mean, I've been covering Berkshire now for 15 plus years, and I'd say probably over the last 10 years or so, it, I think investors have sort of discounted the fact that, you know, Buffett's not going to be there forever. Um, and I think that that's been sort of baked into um, how the valuation has sort of evolved over that time frame. And if you look at it, you know, from, from Buffett's perspective, he's really made a concerted effort over the past two decades to really sort of focus investors, the shareholders on the businesses, on what they have sort of built here, this decentralized conglomerate that really takes care of itself. I mean, the fact that there are so few people at corporate and that Buffett's day-to-day -day duties have really just involved looking at potential capital allocation decisions. He spends far more time reading through K's and Q's and then he does sort of worrying about you know, how one plant is running or how another operation is running. He's really sort of left that down to the managers um, down the line. And that's kind of the beauty of the business model right now is that it, it, it's sort of self-running. And there's not a whole lot that the, the, the corporate is going to need to do going forward, even without Buffett at the helm. Now, I brought this up a few years ago at one of the annual meetings that, 
you know, having Munger, having Buffett both there always gave Berkshire sort of an edge. And we saw that during the financial crisis. We saw it during other periods of time where people that were in need of capital and need of Buffett's seal of approval would come to Berkshire and be willing to pay 10, 11 percent on the amount of capital they were getting from 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 Buffett and company just to have that seal of approval attached to them. And I think that Berkshire will continue to sort of play that role in the future because they're always going to have a lot of capital, a lot of excess capital on the books. But I think that that premium that they've they've been able to garner you know, with Buffett at the helm is probably going to be less than it was, you know, in the past. And when I asked that question, actually, at the meeting, Charlie actually agreed with me and said that, you know, that's that's probably likely to be the case, that you could see a one or two percent percentage reduction. Leave it to Charlie, I guess, to be sort of realistic, <laughs> even if it yeah, was not exactly. in his favor. Thanks to you both. Really appreciate perspective. We got to leave it there. Thomas Hayes, Great Hill Capital Chairman and Managing Member. Good to see you. And Gregory Warren, Morningstar Senior Stock Analyst. Thanks for your perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that does it for now. I'm Julie Hyman with Brian Sazi. Thanks for watching.